Thank you. Welcome to the 18th meeting this year of Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Everyone present should turn off electronic uh, items such as mobile phones and so on, except those who may be using tablets in the line of business, and uh, because these otherwise can interfere with the sound system. Um, first of all, uh, we have a substitute for Cara Hilton, who can't be here, uh, and welcome to Claire Baker. And uh, the first item on the agenda today is uh, the committee to whether to consider take consideration of the work programme in private. Uh, that's due to come up very soon. What, the next meeting. That's at the next meeting. So are we agreed? Yeah. yeah. We're agreed. OK, thank you. We are agreed. Uh, it, agenda item two, the Land Reform Review Group final report. And this uh, item today will take evidence from the Minister for Environment and Climate Change on the Land Reform Review Group's final report. And I welcome uh, the Minister, Paul Wheelhouse, good morning, and his officials, uh, Stephen Patharana from the Head of uh, Land and Reform and Tenancy Unit, and Dave Thompson a regular attender at our committee, one way or another, uh, Head of Land Reform Policy Team in the Scottish Government. Good morning, gentlemen. I invite the Minister to make any introductory statement that he wishes. Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, Committee. Uh, it's good to be here to discuss the Land Reform Review Group's report. First of all, I'd like to thank the Land Reform Review Group and their team of advisors for producing what is a very comprehensive report on land reform, with a total of 62 far-reaching recommendations. Uh, when the Scottish Government set the remit for the Land Reform Review Group, we were clear that it should focus on how to increase diversity of land ownership and support more resilient and independent communities. I'm therefore pleased that the review uh, group started from the position that land is a finite resource and decisions taken on its ownership and use must be taken in the public interest and for the common good, uh, which, with which I wholeheartedly agree. The, this Government's vision is for a Scotland where we acknowledge that land is intimately linked to ideas of well-being, justice, economic opportunity and identity, that our policies ensure Scotland's land works in the benefit uh, to the people of Scotland, that a stronger relationship between land and people will empower people across the whole of Scotland, contributing to both prosperity and sustainable development of the nation. We recognise the empowering nature of land ownership. We view that at present the land ownership is too highly concentrated with it having been put forward that just 0.008% of people own more than 50% of private land. There are circumstances where it can be against the public interest for any individual or organisation to hold a monopoly of land. Uh, diversity creates opportunity and choice and empowers communities as well as individuals. That land as a resource should play its part in building a fairer society. Moving forward, I believe that we need to build a society with greater diversity of land ownership one where communities and individuals have access to land to fulfil their aspirations and their needs. We have a specific target to have one million acres of land in community ownership by 2020, and it's certainly a stretching target. This is sometimes portrayed as pro-community and anti-private ownership, and this is not the case. As concentration of ownership decreases, there will be room for both more community owners and more private owners. It is also clear that land reform in Scotland is not something solely for the highlands and islands or rural Scotland. It is for the whole of Scotland, and we need to take land reform to urban areas to tackle the blight of derelict, derelict land in our cities. The Community Empowerment Bill will take forward some of the recommendations in the report, but not all. The report contains recommendations we may agree with, and some may, we, we may not. Uh, but I welcome the overall direction of travel, and I'm sure that this committee does too. That is why I announced that I will be seeking to bring forward a land reform bill during this term of the Parliament. And if we are able to confirm the figure of 432, that's again 0.008% of the population owning half of the privately owned land in Scotland, then as I've stated previously, this is not a situation where you would create um, or think of creating in terms of designing a system from scratch. And this should not be the case in a modern Scotland. My aim is for land reform to address this by delivering maximum benefits to the people of Scotland and so that we can engender a constructive dialogue on the way forward, finding consensus where we can do so. The Review Group's report has given us the opportunity to frame the land reform debate in Scotland around public interest, and I'm keen to see public land made available for community ownership and other opportunities to diversify uh, land ownership. I hope that we can grasp this opportunity with both hands, and I welcome 
the, the chance to discuss uh, the Land Reform Review Group report with this committee. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, you've uh, suggested that there's going to be a land reform uh, bill coming forward um, and, of course, there's a community empowerment bill uh, on the stocks. Uh, could you help us by suggesting the kind of timetable for both of these, please? Well, the uh, convener of the community empowerment bill it will be introduced imminently. Um, that's all I can say in terms of protocol. It's for Mr Mackay uh, clearly to, to lead in that, but I can assure the committee it is, uh, will be with, uh, with Parliament in short order. And uh, the uh, land reform bill, it is the prerogative and the protocol that the First Minister announces the legislative programme, which is why I've not given further detail on that, and, and that will happen in the normal normal manner uh, later in the year. Uh, but uh, you know, we intend to do so in this Parliament, and that's, that's what I put on record at the Community Land Scotland Conference on Saturday, uh, to give people confidence there will be an opportunity to take forward some of the more uh, longer term, more substantive issues, rather than trying to shoehorn them into the Community Empowerment Bill, uh, when we obviously need time to consider the recommendations and to take a considered view on them. Given the report's uh, inclusion, of matters which it suggests are dealt with in the Community Empowerment Bill. Can uh, such matters be introduced at an early stage or are we going to expect uh, any kind of consultation ahead of uh, their introduction which could come at stage two if the Community Empowerment Bill is imminent? Well, uh, we obviously have uh, consulted on, on, on the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill already and uh, the committee, I hope, will have seen the the sense of direction that we had in that bill in terms of trying to address some of the streamlining of community ownership uh, it, it measures, which ties in with some of the recommendations of the Land Reform Review Group. So we are using the Community Empowerment Bill or proposing to, to take forward some of the, the things which we believe we can do, we have consulted on, and we, we have got a clear view of where we want to go. Um, obviously, members in, the, in, the, in Parliament may will decide to bring things forward at stage two of the Community Empowerment Bill, but we would certainly urge people to, to think about the opportunity of the the wider land reform bill when it comes, that's an opportunity perhaps to take a more considered view of the recommendations and uh, obviously we intend to consult uh, as a government on any proposals we would put forward in the bill. Thank you very much. Um, look at the issue of land registration particularly. Uh, this is seen as pivotal to understanding who owns Scotland and uh, for people to have access to that information. Um, would it be more useful to build a non-definitive rather than a legal title register at an early stage? The, the, clearly, uh, what we have signalled, um, Convener, is that we believe that the, the completion of the register is extremely important to improve transparency. So if you take a focus on the outcomes that we're trying to achieve here, we want to have uh, you know, greater accountability and transparency in terms of ownership of land. So people can identify who is the appropriate landowner, which is not always possible in many cases. And that includes, to be fair, uh, public land as well. We've made clear commitment we need to improve our act as well. But, you know, we need to have greater transparency and accountability for the actions of those who own the land. And so that's, that's the focus. And we've decided, um, my colleague Fergus Ewing, who leads for uh, the, the portfolio interest in terms of Registers of Scotland, and myself have asked Registers of Scotland to, to take forward measures to complete the land register uh, in over a 10-year period and to, to show leadership uh, we want to see all publicly loaned, owned land registered in a five-year period. And uh, I've already had some uh, uh, feedback from the likes of Crown Estate who've committed to, to complete their, their uh, registration within a 10-year period. And I welcome that sort of positive engagement on this issue and encourage others to, to take up the, the opportunity. You'll understand that uh, there's a degree of uh, concern in the, in the committee at the evidence we've heard about this, about the time scale that it would take to do this. And that's why I asked about a non-definitive uh, method of recognising who owns what. Uh, the actual legal boundaries and so on may well take longer because of the difficulties of, uh, uh, of surveying these. But surely it should be possible, Minister, for us to have an outline register that anyone could go into their local council uh, office and find out who owns a substantial piece of land, let's say more than about 50 acres. I, I certainly agree with you, Convener, that we, we need to, to get that kind of understanding and that information is vital to having a, the, the optimisation of, of land, use, land use and, and, and ownership in Scotland. Uh, I'll, I'll bring in Stephen Pathraniya uh, shortly just to, to talk about the detail of this, but 
uh, what we are keen to do, we, we understand the challenge that there is in terms of completing the register time scale. Some have criticised us for taking 10 years. Um, we know that this is going to be an extremely challenging task. Um, it will not come without um, its resource implications, and we need to evaluate what the, what the resource implications will be in full. And that's why we're consulting, obviously, with registers of Scotland themselves on the practicalities of how we deliver this. But there's a very positive attitude from both the register, uh, Registers of Scotland as an organisation, and as I've said already, some, some stakeholders are already saying they, they're willing to sign up to this as well. So I do believe we've, we've got, a, uh, if you like, a consensus. This is a sensible thing to do. It's an important thing to do, and uh, clearly we'll tackle it. But I'll, I'll bring in Stephen uh, Pathanai, if I may, give you just on the detail of, of the definitive versus non-definitive uh, land register. Um, in, in essence, uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, in, in essence, a non-definitive re re register will be a very useful thing to ha have. Um, I certainly think it's something that um, we should be exploring in, at a practical level in terms of how that could be taken forward. It's certainly something that the, both the review group point to and stakeholders point to because obviously the sooner we have a clearer and better picture of the land ownership pattern in Scotland, the more the better for, for, for decision making. I understand, Minister, that uh, the Highland Council commissioned such a register uh, in recent years. I think the area is about 200 acres, but uh, it allowed a very general picture to be made quite quickly within a few months of uh, who owns the bulk of uh, the Highland Council area. Um, since we've got information uh, held by public bodies like SNH, uh, the uh, Forestry Commission, Scottish Water, and indeed the agricultural um, records, the IACS records, Surely it should be possible to tap into these in each area to be able to use uh, some of that information, given that it points to the people who have ownership or are the holders of particular pieces of land. I well, certainly agree, Convener, that the, that process, and if you can identify the general uh, understanding and pattern of land ownership, it would be very helpful from an economic development, planning and, and community development, community planning purposes. Uh, so that it would have great value. I suppose where perhaps a definitive register actually comes to the aid of the landowner themselves, and they've got, uh, as with crofting, for example, we made the point in terms of crofting, I know it's a different issue, but, but the point about being able to register a definitive boundary of your croft then gives you certainty from the point of view of engagement with lenders, engagement with uh, neighbours in terms of resolving disputes. Uh, so there are advantages to a landowner from having a definitive register, and I think that's one thing we're taking into account. But certainly, I take your point, Convener, from the point of view of uh, using existing data to fully inform us at a local level as to what the general pattern of ownership is so we've got a rough idea as to who owns a bit of land or at least be able to tell between two different landowners rather than not knowing who owns it at all um, would, be, would be helpful to, to all economic development partners and indeed uh, for, for planning purposes as well. Well, just before I bring in some supplementaries, um, uh, you know, whether it's the case that, uh, you know, it is the case that most Forestry Commission land is not registered, you know, and I put it to one of the panel last week that uh, perhaps we should be looking to uh, the bodies who own land to put up the money to get the registration process done. Now, I suggested to them that Forestry Commission could sell off a few affordable housing plots, uh, you know, in order to cover the costs of making the maps. This could apply, I suppose, to private owners. Do you think that we should be insisting that people actually spend the money to get the process started of mapping their land? Well, we, well certainly I think the first step is to, to get um, you know, positive engagement from all stakeholders that this is a valuable exercise. I think we are beginning to see that. People are sort of recognising, as I say, we've already had some stakeholders write to me as, as a minister to say, look, you know, we're, we, we're, we're up for this. And I, uh, I very much welcome that positive construction of approach. Uh, we need to best understand the financial implications, what it will actually cost. We've got a rough idea, um, but we need to get more definitive uh, figures because we're accelerating effectively an existing timescale we had for completion of the register. And we had some costings uh, for that, but you know, accelerating it will make it more expensive. So we need to understand that, work that through. Um, as to who pays for it, I think that's something we need to come back to the committee on in due course. But um, but clearly we uh, are looking at, from the point of view of Forestry Commission, um, 
you know, are, are keen to engage in that, and uh, we I recognise convener the point you make about a lot of the Forestry Commission land not being registered, and uh, I think we all accept that is not an acceptable position to be in, and it's in everybody's interest that that land is registered. So uh, there's a certain element from public sector point of view, we'll take that on the chin, and we will, um, you know, fr from our own from point of view of our own organisations, have to, to to incorporate that cost into our own budgets. But we need to work through the uh, implications for others outside of government in terms of completing the register. I must put a final point on this to you. You mentioned in your answer that uh, crofters have to put up the money to do their own registration. It would seem only fair that larger landowners who are far more wealthy in every sense than crofters actually put up that money and that we can get some sort of guidance on that from you soon would be very helpful. We will certainly will, Convener. You'll understand, <coughs> I hope, that uh, this is a matter of Fergus Ewing as the policy lead in terms of the the uh, register, and I, I don't want to make policy on the hoof for, for Mr. Mr. Ewing, but we are engaging in the dialogue about how we achieve this, and I will uh, make contact after this committee meeting with, with Mr. Ewing to see if we can give a more considered view as to how the charging for this uh, may work uh, okay. in terms of the future. Uh, some supplementaries. Claire Baker. Thank you, Convener. Um, first of all, can I say I welcome the Minister's initial comments and hope that um, those members who are committed to taking forward land reform can bring forward a radical agenda on this. Um, just to go back to the issue of cost, when we had the meeting last week with the stakeholders, there was a feeling that um, while the information the transparency was certainly important, there were perhaps other ways to achieve this. And there were comments that if the cost would be better spent and there could be greater gains, um, rather than committing it to the land register. Now, the other issue is if we look back at stage um, two and three of the land register bill, um, Fergus Ewing was pretty clear about the costs, and that was one of the reasons he didn't commit to a timescale, um, and the language around that was um, not particularly helpful on, on some of, you know, there was options put to members. Did, did they want to spend it on land register, or did they want to take the money from schools and hospitals? There was that kind of language went on at the committee. Then that might have been committee banter, but there was certainly an issue that he identified around um, how much this was going to cost. Um, so greater clarity on that would certainly be welcome. And the other point around um, link, the, the report also made comments that there has been land reform uh, issues pursued, but they have been pretty scattered and have not been coherent, and the land registration bill is a key example of that. Um, that was taken forward. It seemed like there wasn't much awareness of a land reform agenda around the passage of that bill. So as we're looking at the Community and Power Bill being introduced, can we ensure that we have um, greater coherence in government and that that bill is seen as a vehicle for um, community ownership and for taking forward the land reform agenda? I, uh, I certainly welcome, can I say initially, I welcome the, the positive uh, remarks from Claire Baker about the report itself, and I certainly share her view that this is an important piece of work and contribute to the land reform agenda. In terms of the, the points that are fairly made about the re cost of registration and the debate there has been previously, um, I will, you know, as I say, we'll come back to the committee with uh, Mr Ewing's thoughts on, on that as well. Uh, I think that's a, a fair point that Claire Baker has made about we have to make choices, and if this is a high priority in terms of achieving the registration in, in, a, in the timescale that we've set out, then that will have potentially consequences in terms of uh, financing, financing that. But we'll try and give greater clarity to the committee so you're, you're informed yourselves in terms of bringing forward your own thoughts on the implications of the Land Reform Review Group. In terms of the coherence issue, I do accept that you know, there, there have been um, you know, various strands of land reform uh, action being taken by this government and indeed previous administrations in well, as well. And I know the, the Land Reform Review Group have, have called for perhaps, a, if I can describe it as a, kind of a, a, a sort of a land policy, a sort of more of a, an overarching land policy. And I think that's certainly an interesting issue which we are considering about how we bring land use, if you like, land, uh, the look of land reform issues, land use, which I know some people obviously regard land use as being integral to land, land reform as well, so I'm not saying they're necessarily totally distinct, but, um, but take, we've got an existing land use strategy which, which is obviously uh, goes through a period of, of continual review and, and updating. Um, you know, obviously, we've had a very important exercise in terms of land reform review group, which has looked at a number of aspects of land reform and, and very much welcomed the report. And whether we take that forward in terms of a more overarching strategy to tie, tie these together, obviously, there's interaction with the planning system, there's interaction with other policies in terms of biodiversity or, or, or even climate change. So there, there's a whole raft of areas of government policy which land has an impact on, housing strategy, uh, other areas as well. So, 
So I think there is a case perhaps to be made for having a more overarching view about how, how all these particular strands of land reform and land use integrate with each other and interplay so that we can understand the importance of land reform in the context uh, and how it contributes to economic development, housing, um, fulfilling uh, you know, needs in terms of the agriculture sector and other areas as well. So I do take that point. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that there's been a complete lack of coherence. You wouldn't expect me to say that. Um, but I think we have uh, certainly got a, a clear focus now on looking and reviewing the, the recommendations of the Land Reform Review Group, identifying those that we can take forward. There may be areas of the report, as I say, where perhaps a specific measure that has been recommended isn't something that we particularly support, but we still support the outcome that the, uh, the Land Reform Review Group are trying to achieve and maybe find another way of doing so. And I would certainly welcome the views of the committee if, if you have any views along those lines as well about specific recommendations that perhaps you think could be tweaked to be better, a better way of achieving the same, same result. Uh, we'd certainly take, take that on board and be interested to hear them. Thank you very much. Good morning, Minister. Good morning. I, I, I see what you've just been talking about very much as a three-stage process in this context of which the land reform itself is actually the third. Uh, clearly, that can only come after what I think the second, which is a definitive legal register. But stage one would seem to be a, an obvious apparent use ownership kind of register in my recollection as a city councillor in Dundee for a while, uh, we were already trying to build. And I'm just wondering whether, and this is not your portfolio, I recognise, but whether the government is exploring whether the databases actually already exist, and it is plural. In other words, local authorities and possibly other organisations actually already possess, I suspect, a great deal of that non-definitive register. I'm just wondering whether somebody has explored how much of this information we really have got spread around? I mean, Convener, could I bring Stephen Pathan in at this point uh, to address Mr Don's question? So I should, have, I should have, when I spoke earlier, should have continued that line of, of, of my point that there are lots and lots of different registers out there for different purposes, and some of them have already been mentioned, like the IX register. So <coughs> the resources are out there to make a non-definitive register. It's about how it's brought together and, and in what time frame we can do that. But clearly it can be done more quickly. We have to acknowledge, though, it's non-definitive. It comes with, it creates greater transparency in the, in the first instance. It doesn't necessarily deliver all the benefits of having a complete land register, which should also be a, a goal that's sitting there in the background that we should be working towards. But, it, but yes, we're, it, it is being explored, and we are looking at how it, uh, how it could be done. Right. Could, could, I, convener, could I just caution about bringing things together? They don't need to be brought together as long as you know where to find the information you yeah. want. The idea of getting one register for the whole of Scotland just so we've got it is one I would suggest you don't need to follow. And, and to, to illustrate the point, if you want to find out what land the Forestry Commission owns today, you can go onto their website, they hold a map, right. and all their, all their land is already on it. So despite it not being on the land register, it is visible to the public. Okay. Graham Day. Uh, thank and you. Just to develop on that point, if I may, about the non-definitive <coughs> register, um, the Minister talked earlier about stakeholders having indicated a positive response to this, like he cited the Crown Estate. But I'm wondering where NGOs like the National Trust for Scotland, RSPB, the Scottish Wildlife Trust, who do hold great care for the image that they have, where they sit in this in terms of engagement and willingness to participate. And beyond that, in terms of public bodies, I wonder what thought has been given to engagement with the MOD, who are very substantial landowners in Scotland and uh, presumably would be cooperative. And it just strikes me that we could fairly quickly get to the point where we've got a fairly um, instructive, non-definitive register in, in good time frames. Well, indeed, uh, uh, Graeme Day uh, alludes to the, the, the point I was making earlier on. I believe there is an opportunity for... This is one of the perhaps area where I think there's an opportunity for consensus. I mean, there are parts of, obviously, land reform and some of the recommendations where I believe um, there will be understandably differences of opinion about the way forward, but I think it's in everybody's interest uh, to have greater transparency and accountability for, for land ownership. And if we can do it, in, as, as Mr Don described, in a two-step process, I think that's helpful. It certainly will improve the um, understanding in the short term, and over the 10-year period, hopefully, we will get to a point where we've got a complete register. So we're keen to work with those landowners. We recognise the opportunity when we have got large landowners, such as uh, the NGOs, or indeed private landowners, to um, get large blocks of Scotland registered in a reasonably uh, speedy way. It's not 
I've got, I've got a caution, though, that I, I appreciate there's also a resource issue for registers of Scotland and how fast they can actually physically do that, um, which clearly we, that's why we are consulting with registers of Scotland, uh, Mr Ewing and myself, in terms of the practicalities of this. But registers of Scotland believe it's, it's doable, um, and so we'll, we'll, you know, it will have its challenges, but that we can do this, and so we need to have an honest discussion about what resource it will take to do that. Uh, but I agree with you wholeheartedly that if we can work with likes of RSBB, ISWT, NTS and others to, to register the land that will eat into the, the chunks. And as to the MOD, we haven't had any direct dialogue with them on this issue yet, but I think it's a fair point and we, we should do uh, to, to, to sound them out as to whether they're willing to, to engage in this process constructively. And Jim Hume? Yes, just on, on the issue with, with, with IACS, of course IACS is, covers most of the farming land that, that, that is involved with common agricultural policy, and we'll see if that's still relevant after today's <laughs> announcement. I'm sure it will be. But um, obviously, have you seriously considered, I mean, uh, Stephen's already mentioned it, but seriously considered using that as a very easy system to uh, maybe just have an extra uh, box on, on that form rather than extra forms uh, going out across Scotland? I think, I think um, Camilla, it's a very sensible suggestion to look at these these options because if if it avoids people having to do mapping twice or, or you know if there's existing maps there's ways in which we can work with the register to to see what data is already provided and, and whether that's of sufficient quality to, to inform the, the process then I'm happy to look at that and certainly recommend uh, that uh, that we do look look at that obviously it's Mr Ewing's uh, portfolio responsibility but we can pass that message back that that might be an opportunity and clearly within the portfolio we've we've got considerable expertise in, in, in the IAX uh, system as you would expect and I can confirm there will be a, a common agricultural policy statement today so I don't think you have to worry about there not being a common agricultural policy uh, provision in Scotland so you know we will um, uh, I think take forward constructive uh, proposals like that Mr Hume as to how we can we can use existing information. We don't want to create a situation which is overly bureaucratic for people if we can avoid it. I think that's a very you know, sensible, sensible way to, to, to progress if it can be used by the register. Only one part of it, of course, half of Scotland is, of course, um, um, tenant farmed, and it would be therefore the tenant farmer that was actually inputting that, that, that data. But, um, There's a the possibility like a... where you have, I, I suppose, large, larger states which have many tenants to, to coordinate that in some way, mm -hmm. or at least to give them you know, uh, guidance on what they need to do. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll certainly take that positive okay. uh, suuggestion forward to see if there's well, some way we can work with that. Thanks. I'd like to make a final point on this. There was raised by witnesses that uh, the committee that uh, completing the mapping process for crofting does need some extra uh, input uh, to help people do that. Can we leave it with you that you will find some answers for that in due course? Because I guess that's got money implications. But yes. I mean, it, it certainly can be something that's exercising me on a, a regular basis. I, you know, obviously, clearly we now have a mandatory register, and, and people will have to register as they uh, uh, go through any uh, regulated activity through the Crofting Commission. Uh, so it will, you know, update as time goes on. But clearly, we don't want to take that that to take many, many years. We'd rather reach a position where we had com uh, as complete a register for crofting as possible. Uh, and I, I would just put in record, we will come back to the committee, but I would put in record that I, I welcome the very constructive approach that registers of Scotland have taken to this issue and they've put in some of their own uh, resource to help uh, tackle the challenge. So we'll come back with further detail. Um, thank you. Uh, that was the first of our ten questions <laughs> and uh, we can't afford to uh, spend as much on each of them or else we'll be here tomorrow. Uh, uh, can we remember members and minister that we've got quite a lot of ground to cover? So, the ownership of land, Claire Baker. Thank you, convener. And the review group looked to try and address the issue of over, sorry, offshore ownership and uh, improve traceability and accountability. Um, does the minister accept the need for this and can identify what the difficulties are with the current system when it comes to identifying um, ownership? The third point, just briefly, is that the report also said that this, however, the proposal they put on the table, which is about a legal entity having to be registered within a member state, wouldn't necessarily address the issue of beneficial ownership. Um, maybe the Minister would like to comment on that also. Well, um, clearly the, the, the Land Reform Review Group uh, saw this as a very important issue. And I think if we try and um, understand why it's been raised uh, initially before looking at the specific proposal, it goes back to the issue of transparency, convener, and, and just uh, the ability of people to know and to be accountable, obviously the owner, to be accountable for their actions in terms of the... Uh, 
uh, performance as, as a landowner. Uh, so that's that's what's driving this. Whether it's the the um, ultimately what we will go for in terms of uh, a solution, I cannot see at this stage because we are we are going to have to listen to views about the practicalities of it and, and consult on it. But I do certainly support the land reform review groups. Uh, sense of direction here and they're trying to get an outcome where there's greater transparency and who owns and accountability obviously in terms of we don't want to have a situation where there perhaps uh, um, is a complete lack of understanding who owns who owns the land and um, perhaps uh, maybe an overseas owner in some case it may be a obviously a domestic owner in other situations uh, that they're not um, accountable for their actions I understand the points that are being made about the by land reform review group about the legal entity EU legal entity is to give if you like a legal persona to, to the owner and to have that you know accountable within European legal context uh, so it's one of the areas that we're, we're, we're interested in looking at to, to improve transparency and uh, we will certainly come back in, in due course with our thoughts on this uh, as to sort of the issue about beneficial owners I don't know whether maybe I can ask Stephen to, to comment on that um, I think there are lots of challenges around how you address this issue of transparency and of course addressing the issue around beneficial owners is more challenging than having a, a, a clear accountable person for argument say within the EU which is what they're proposing um, you could argue the way a country like Denmark tackles this is, is by saying if you own farmland you have to be a natural person you can't own farmland in Denmark being a a legal person. So there are different ways of dealing with these sorts of questions and it's certainly something that I think we should, you know, the objective here really for, for government would be to explore the intent behind the recommendation the review group made as opposed to focus on the specific um, recommendation they're making, think how, how do you do this? An early stage in terms of the announcement around the bill, but do you um, would you you know, can you say if, if the, the bill will look to the consultation will look to address this issue and accept that the solution brought forward by the review group might not be the one the government would like to support? That the government didn't support it came forward at the land registration bill to bring that up again. Uh, this solution and the government didn't support it at that point. Um, but will the trying to address the issue of transparency and accountability be covered by the bill? And um, also back to the land registration bill, uh, there was an amendment came forward on beneficial ownership. Um, which at the time the Minister said could be in some way built into regulations around the land <coughs> register. Um, it could be a condition of um, the land register. I don't know if the Minister is able mm. today to say more about that or is it maybe something you could look into in a bit more detail? I'm, I'm happy to come back to the committee on this. It's a really good example, I suppose, of uh, a number of the recommendations of the, of the Land Reform Review Group don't necessarily fall within the rural affairs environment portfolio and this is clearly a, a good example of it the, the point that's been very fairly made about the previous land register bill as a uh, land reg registration bill has uh, as was demonstrated in that Fergus Ewing was leading on that bill so in this case I need to work with colleagues like Fergus Ewing to understand what the ramifications are whether there's any scope for for uh, taking on board these ideas as they've been put forward by Land Reform Review Group. But what I would say in answer to the other part of the question, absolutely we want to, to address in whatever proposals we bring forward that we address the issue about transparency and accountability. Whether this is ultimately the solution we go for, I can't see at this stage because we're only three weeks into having had the, the report. But, um, you know, and, and clearly we've got a lot of thinking to do about the, the package, if you like, of measures that you would bring forward in a bill. But... Um, but it's certainly something we're, we're interested to deliver uh, to make sure that Scotland has uh, a, a transparent uh, land ownership system that people can understand. I mean, I've had experience as a community councillor in the past, and by going back to, to a long time, seems a hell of a long time ago, excuse me if you're using that language, computer, um, uh, uh, when I was a community councillor in Coburn's Path, and trying to find the owner of a, a building that was falling into dereliction proved extremely difficult. Um, took six months, in fact, to, to find out lots of Googling and lots of looking through various documents. I actually was congratulated by ultimately the, the, the chap I found for having found him. Um, and he was a member of a, an exiled member of a former royal family in Europe. So, um, you know, it, it just goes to show that, um, you know, it is extremely difficult for community groups and people to, to who, who need to find out, you know, some, in this case, the, the, the chap's interest, his building was falling down. Uh, we're going to be falling down and we were trying to help him save that building. Um, 
And uh, you know, so even if it's in the landowner's interest for you to make contact, it's very difficult for you to do so in many cases. So we do need to have a more transparent system. We do need to have a complete register. So these issues are no longer a problem in future. And we also need to have accountability in terms of legal and tax issues and so forth. So I think these are very important issues and we will obviously reflect on the report and come back with proposals. Many of us had, have experience of uh, community councils, some of them not obviously where you were, but uh, we indeed... I was a community councillor, <laughs> so, so I'm not criticising community councils. So was I. Before. Um, yes, indeed. But uh, Jim Hume. Yes, sir. Thanks very much, uh, convener. Uh, when the review group uh, were in front of us, I, I sort of pushed regarding any legal in entity, would that be individuals, they, they, they recommended it would be also pushed regarding would it uh, boil down to uh, individual building plots therefore anybody from outside the EU wouldn't be allowed to uh, buy a building plot and I, I used the example of somebody that's been to New Zealand and coming back and maybe has a New Zealand passport they said that that would be the case and also mentioned about retrospective people that actually own land already and uh, would that have any ramifications for those sort of individuals so a couple of questions there I mean, I, I would clearly uh, just remind the committee that this is a recommendation from the Land Reform Review Group rather than the government, yeah. but we are you know, looking at it. Uh, as I understand it, the desire is not to stop people from outside the European Union owning land, but to make sure there's greater transparency about who, who it is and, and to make sure they have a, a legal persona in some shape or form in the European Union that is that technically owning the land. So that could either, as Mr Prathernaya said, um, be a... Uh, you know, a, a natural person or, or a, indeed a, a, a legal person as, as you define it in terms of a company. Um, so I think there's just a desire from what I can understand to, to make sure that there is greater transparency and accountability for those that are owning land. And there are other measures that the Land Reform Review Group have, have recommended which we may or may not take forward about, about the, the, the extent to which an individual from, uh, you know, of any description, whether they're from Scotland or elsewhere, should own land. Uh, in Scotland. So it's, a, it's got to be seen in the context of a package of measures that the Land Reform Review Group have put forward. But my understanding is they're just trying to ensure uh, improve transparency and accountability, but not to limit the nationalities of those who own land in Scotland. Uh, moving on to public land ownership and community acquisition costs, Dave Thompson to lead. Uh, uh, morning, Steve. Minister. I hope you enjoyed the Community Land Scotland Conference on Saturday, which we, we both attended. Uh, uh, and, convener, I have to say that the NHS cloning unit isn't working very well because Dave Thompson looks nothing like me. <laughs> um, if I could just pick up, uh, I, w I was very pleased actually to hear them this morning, Minister, you reaffirming your acceptance of the, the view that uh, land, you know, is a finite resource to be used uh, in relation to the public interest and for the common good. Because I think that is an absolutely paramount sort of principle that I think we all have to bear in mind as we go through the process of looking at this report and implementing various recommendations and so on. Can I say that um, in terms of the, the Crown estate, um, it's a reserved issue. Uh, there have been many, many reports um, over the last number of years, um, running right through from 2007, the Crown Estate in Scotland report, the Kalman Commission recommended devolution of Crown Estate. Um, there was recommendations from the Scotland Bill Committee, consensus across all the parties in Scotland about devolving the Crown Estate. Um, it, it hasn't happened. Nothing has actually happened. Scottish Affairs Committee just recently reiterated its view that it should be devolved. So, first of all, I, I would like just to ask if you agree that it should be devolved. Um, and secondly, how do you think we can achieve this given the consensus in Scotland over the last seven years and more and yet there is no inkling that Westminster is going to accede to that request? Well, I think, I think uh, Dave Thompson, MSP, rather, Dave Thompson to my, to my right, has... has um, definitely struck a very important issue, which I rec fully recognise is shared, I think, around the, the parliamentary chamber by colleagues from all parties that, uh, you know, where the Crown Estate in Scotland takes its direction from Westminster or Holly Holyrood, we believe firmly, I think, collectively in this parliament that 
uh, and, and ministers have certainly made this point time and again, that the administration of the Crown Estate in Scotland should be uh, residing with Scottish ministers and be accountable to the Scottish Parliament uh, for its activities in Scotland. I'm not, we're not asking for Crown Estate activities outside of Scotland, clearly. Um, I, it is regrettable that that has been uh, ignored. That request has been ignored to date. There have been, obviously, as um, Dave Thompson has identified, been an opportunity in the Scotland Bill 2012 to have done so, which was missed. And I'm sure that was something that probably all of us in this room uh, regret um, that didn't happen. Uh, it would be remiss of me not to point out that uh, clearly a vote for independence would mean that the Crown Estate would be devolved to Scotland and that is one vehicle by which the people of Scotland can secure that. I'm sure my colleagues from opposition parties will have their own view about how that can be achieved, uh, so I'm not uh, necessarily saying I speak for them, but certainly for the, from the SNP point of view, the Scottish Government point of view, clearly um, a vote for independence would see Crown Estate in Scotland managed in Scotland. And I believe I, I, I put on record on the, uh, my speech at the weekend to Community Land Scotland, this is not a criticism of the individuals in the organisation um, who uh, you know, uh, you know, are performing their function and trying to generate revenues for, uh, for the Crown Estate to be given to, 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 to use by the public. Um, we just believe that should be managed and accountable to the people of Scotland. And obviously we have a desire to... Uh, devolve it to Scotland and then obviously pass devolution of that to, to communities as well if we can do and clearly we'll be uh, hoping to set out our plans in that in due course. Thanks Minister, if I can just follow on uh, convener. Yeah, I mean the, the big concern about the Crown Estate of course is, uh, as it states in the report its whole purpose is to maintain and enhance the value of the estate and the return obtained to it uh, from it. So in other words the, the sole purpose of the Crown Estate Commissioners is to get as much money as possible out of their properties and assets and foreshore to feed into the Treasury, which isn't going to, to help communities because that's not their purpose. Their purpose is to make money. And we've seen plenty of examples around Scotland where public works are going ahead, but it's a commercial rate that the Crown Estate charge. Uh, I'm pleased that you mentioned the, the, the further devolution because that's something that I'm very, very interested in, uh, because the report does state very clearly they feel it should be a two-stage process, that Scotland should get uh, control of the Crown Estate, or their power should be lifted when it comes to the Scottish Ministers. And um, the report also very interestingly mentions the Lerwick Declaration, where the First Minister and Western Isles Orkney and Shetland Councils uh, have um, agreed various things and it, according to the report here, it appears to demonstrate a commitment to the decentralisation of Crown Estate Commission responsibilities if they are devolved. So you've confirmed that you believe that would be the right way to do it. Can you let us know at the moment whether, you mentioned local communities, whether it would be via local authorities or local development trusts, or do you have any idea at the moment just how that might be achieved? I'm, I'm in a difficult position in this one, convener, in that I have a good idea as to how we might do this, but um, for reasons I hope Mr Thompson will understand, I'm not at liberty to divulge uh, the approach that we are taking at this point. There are, as, as uh, Dave Thompson identified, the, the Larwick Declaration, there's work going on between both governments and the, uh, the island communities at the moment to discuss the implications of independence, either a yes vote, which uh, the government advocates, or, or, or indeed uh, the, the, the no vote option, as to what the, the opportunities are for the island authorities. And there's been, obviously, discussion on that, which is in the public domain, that the Crown Estate has been uh, one of the items that has been discussed. So I'm, I'm, I'm in a difficult position. I can't, I'm afraid, uh, convener, as much as I'd like to um, help uh, Mr Thompson uh, understand what the issues are. I, what I can state is, though, that we clearly want the revenues um, of the Crown Estate that are generated to benefit local communities and to, to make the maximum possible contribution to sustaining uh, local communities around Scotland and fragile parts of the country where uh, Crown Estate revenues are obviously potentially going to grow significantly uh, in the future, both with, both with the growth of renewable sector uh, offshore and indeed onshore in some cases, but also uh, the uh, aquaculture sector, which is extremely uh, important source of revenue to the Crown Estate. So these are issues that are uh, of uh, great relevance, clearly, to areas such as uh, Dave Thompson's constituency, and I fully recognise that, and I hope in 
not too distant future, you will have great clarity on this. Well, I'm very pleased about that, Minister, that, that local communities uh, all over Scotland, but particularly in the Highlands and Islands, where we've got an awful lot of the coast, uh, the vast bulk of, of it, I, I, would, I would suggest, uh, can look forward to getting control over, over those assets and start making decisions to benefit the, the local communities. Can I maybe just move on quickly, convener, to the issue of state aid? and the interpretation of the current uh, manual rules, etc., and the aversion or the ap apparent aversion to risk that is shown by those who are interpreting the rules, which gives us all sorts of problems in relation to helping community developments. Uh, could you maybe just tell us a wee bit about um, what your views are on turning that sort of negative view of state aid into something a bit more positive and helpful, which would allow us to move on. Uh. Well, it's a hugely important issue. I addressed it at the Community Alliance Scotland conference because we, we have had some challenges in terms of state aid, particularly in relation to the National Forest Land Scheme, uh, where we have been keen to uh, encourage community ownership of, of woodlands in Scotland. Uh, now, clearly, there is an issue of interpretation here about state aids. We want to see state aids being used as a positive thing, potentially, as, as Dave Thompson has alluded to, uh, to um, as a, our understanding of it, to facilitate um, you know, good community projects, ones which don't distort you know, cross-border uh, trade and inter-EU uh, you know, uh, trade. Uh, clearly, where you have a, a community project which is perhaps... Um, got uh, a focus on improving the amenity of an area, it's not going to interact with uh, commercial timber extraction, perhaps, or the commercial timber market. Where we have to take a view is perhaps where there is a community project where there is uh, an element of it which is a commercial uh, forestry uh, operation, and there may be an element of sell selling that timber onto, onto the market as to whether it's realistic to suggest when that is happening that it is actually going to distort European Union-wide trade. Uh, and the vast majority of cases, I'm confident we could, we could demonstrate it, it won't. Um, but we need to do it on a case-by-case -case basis, I think, rather than have a one-size-fits-all approach. So we've, we are taking the view, uh, as we have done recently with recent awards to the National Forest Land Scheme, that we are satisfied that those projects do not distort uh, trade within the European Union, and therefore we have supported them uh, on that basis. So it's using the state aids policy intelligently and, and taking into account local circumstances to make sure we can facilitate projects where clearly they have significant community benefit in terms of improving the resilience of a local community, its economic future, perhaps environmental improvements, uh, but at the same time it's not going to distort uh, competition in the commercial timber market or any other sector. So that's, that's the nature of the debate we have to have about state aid. There's been a lot of work going on. If I may, come here very briefly bring in Stephen Parthenaya, because I'm not conscious of time, but I know Stephen has been looking closely at this issue. Um, the Minister has covered most of, most of the ground here. I mean, so the only thing I'd add is part of moving forward is very much about communities as well, actually helping communities understand state aid better, because they need to be in a position where they understand what they're doing, can articulate it well, and, and, and test whether what they're doing should be subject to it or, or not subject to it. And I think that, that dialogue between communities and funders will be an important part of breaking sort of the historic deadlock we've had in, in this area around certain projects going forward. Uh, convener. Um, the report as well recommends that um, the Scottish Public Finance Manual's need for, well, to, which prohibits the transfer of public land at less than market value, should be reviewed. And I just wonder if the Minister could let us know in principle if he's in favour, where it's in the public interest to transfer public assets to local communities at less than its market value. Well, this is something, I mean, obviously we, we have a great sympathy with this, this issue because uh, clearly we have a public policy objective where we want to see public uh, land being used by communities for community ownership. There's been a lot of focus in this debate about developing community ownership on, uh, you know, the, on, on, on the implications for private landowners, but we clearly have a strategy as a government and I think it's the right thing to do to try and encourage communities to take on ownership of, of whether it's Arpid Estate, Croft, Crofting Estate, or indeed the National Forest uh, Estate as well, other opportunities to, where we want to see communities 
uh, have high aspirations for their future, to take ownership of the land uh, forward. And it can be a bit of a barrier to us. We end up paying ourselves effectively uh, through the land fund in some cases um, to, uh, to, to, to buy public land. And that's, I don't think that's an ideal situation. It would be far uh, more satisfactory in some ways if we could uh, give the land a, a, a low price or, or, or one pound or whatever to, to make sure that the, um, the community gets uh, the benefit of, of the land and the public good, uh, common good is served in that way and it satisfies uh, public policy interest as well. Um, without um, putting a financial barrier up. But we, the, the uh, public finance manual is being reviewed by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance. It's one of the areas that's obviously outside our direct portfolio uh, responsibilities. But you know, we have uh, put these points in the mix. And uh, you know, colleague Stephen Pathanaya is, is engaging with uh, the Cabinet Secretary's uh, for Finance's uh, team on these issues. So um, if there's any supplementaries, obviously, I can ask uh, Mr Pathanai to answer them, but I can assure Dave Thompson that this is under review and we are looking at it from our portfolio perspective to try and enable more community ownership, if possible. Coming on to community ownership, Nigel. <coughs> Thank you very much, convener. Um, the report that we're discussing suggests that there might be a, a, a large menu of rights for communities. Uh, a right to register an interest over land, the right to preempt uh, the purchase of land, uh, the right to actually request to buy public land, a request for a compulsory purchase order. I seem to recall also something about the prospect of a compulsory sale order in appropriate circumstances, and indeed in some even the right to buy. Um, clearly there are restrictions and criteria to, uh, across all of those. I'm just wondering if I could ask you your reaction to that general idea of a menu of rights. Well, um, the first thing to say uh, to, to, to that, um, Mr Don, is that we, through the process of the Land Reform Review Group uh, report being prepared, we, while we, we uh, you know, very much kept the independence, if you like, of the group, and resp I respected that, so I didn't direct what they were looking at. We did engage with them as they were developing their ideas with a view to the fact the Community Empowerment Bill was coming forward, uh, trying to get some early feedback as to things they might think need to be tackled in terms of uh, the existing Land Reform Act 2003 uh, in terms of community registration, community right to buy provisions. So, uh, as, as you may have uh, uh, noticed, in terms of the, the consultation on the Community Empowerment Bill, we did float some, some ideas which came out of that. So, we have tried to reflect, if you like, in the, in the consultation on the bill, um, the areas in which there was early knowledge, if you like, that from the Land Reform Review Group that things could be tidied up and made more streamlined and and also we looked at some of the, these issues in terms of uh, uh, preemption and, and right to buy. So, uh, as I say, I'm kind of tied up and I can't uh, reveal in advance of Mr Mackay's uh, introduction of the bill itself precisely what was in there, but we have already consulted on a number of these issues and we'll uh, see in due course those which we are taking forward in the bill. Uh, what I guess I'd like to explore, and I don't want to push you into areas where you feel you can't go, and I respect that, is, is I suppose the, the, the thrust of this goes right the way through to a community, quite simply, having the right under certain circumstances to say, we want to buy that, and being entitled to do that under some fairly restricted circumstances. Now, is that an endpoint which you see as acceptable in the general principle of things? Well, clearly, we think that there there are uh, case, there's a case to be made in, in circumstances for community to have a right to buy. We've obviously got existing provisions which are um, benefiting the, those in the crofting estate in terms of uh, crofting right to buy, which has been exercised uh, in cases. And we are uh, continually developing a pipeline of, of projects and. Uh, all I can say in advance of the bill being lodged, that I'm very sympathetic to the point where we, we need to uh, provide opportunities, but fairly though, uh, I have to stress that to those who already own land, um, fairly to allow communities to, to take forward their aspirations where there are particular challenges for them in terms of maybe access to land for housing, economic development, perhaps environmental improvements where that's justified or needed. You know, so there are circumstances in which the public interest is served uh, as defined by the, the Land Reform Review Group uh, in terms of uh, community ownership taking place. So, uh, you know, ministers always have, I should stress, ministers in the process always have the ability to, to review an application 
and to obviously approve or not approve, depending on whether it's serving the public interest and passing the tests that are already set out in the existing land reform uh, act 2003. So, um, not to say it would be unfettered, but we are interested in that area. Okay. So we'll there. Um, uh, Alec Ferguson. Thank you. I just I seek a point of clarification, Minister. Good morning to you, by the way. Um, you, you mentioned in your opening um, statement the possibility <laughs> of bringing, um, bringing forward um, measures at stage two of a bill. And I've no idea whether this aspect of what we're talking about is what you're relating to. But given the fact that a, a, a number of stakeholders in evidence to us already, written and oral, have um, pointed to what they see as a failure uh, or a lack of being consulted with, particularly in the second part of the Land Review Group's exercise, um, and, and fairly strong feelings that they should have been. Can you, can you give us an assurance that the government will not introduce um, anything at stage two of a bill that has not been fully consulted on by all the stakeholders involved? Well, um, if I can first of all can we, uh, challenge the, 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 the position that has been taken by some that there wasn't any consultation in stage two. Uh, where the, uh, I mean, I can bring in uh, Dave Thompson on this point uh, shortly, but where, where we have um, seen the Land Reform Review Group having perhaps a need for greater clarity on what, was be, uh, what had been submitted in the stage one evidence, perhaps they have gone to uh, individual uh, groups for clarification on points that they needed th that degree of clarity. So they have had discussions. The vast majority of stakeholders, I understand, have uh, pointed to this in response to some of the criticism and said, actually, we felt that the stage two uh, process, there was consultation where it was required. I appreciate there are one or, one or two stakeholders who feel they weren't adequately consulted and were disappointed with the content of the report. But I think it's wrong to say that there wasn't consultation where the Land Reform Review Group felt it was necessary to supplement their knowledge or to clarify points that had been made by, by those submitting. They have done so. Um, but if I could maybe briefly just... I know, appreciate Mr Ferguson wants to come back, but if I can bring in Dave Thompson just to, to expand on that point, because uh, he was closely involved with it. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the two stages of the, the group's work were... were from the beginning identified as the first phase being the collection of the evidence to, to try and give them a broad base and the second was was primarily focused on on the end goal the report itself by that midway stage the group had some ideas of the topics they wanted to explore further the ones they needed clarification mm -hmm. on and that's where they focused the energy over and above speaking to particular organizations or individuals for points of clarification they also had their team of 13 advisors who had experience and and good knowledge of particular areas, um, for example, in housing, planning, um, etc. So they use those as well to, to develop their ideas further and to point them in other directions of, of other individuals and organisations they could speak to. So it was a more focused consultation, if you like, in the second phase on particular points that the group wanted to put in the report. It was inevitable that given that the width of the, the, the topic and the remit that the group had, they were never going to be able to collect all the evidence on all the topics from all the people who wanted to say anything. Um, so that's the reason for the focused approach in phase two. I, I, I understand that. Mm -hmm. I might not agree with it, but I understand it. But my point is that if uh, the government was to bring in uh, an amendment at stage two to a bill, which might impact on, for instance, uh, the Scottish Moorland group, who, uh, and it's quite possible that a community uh, right to buy might impact on that, uh, you know, the interests of that group. Now, they specifically have said that they were not consulted on. Now, all I'm asking the minister to do is to give us an assurance that he would not introduce something at stage two of a bill that would not have been fully consulted on, but, but which might have a considerable impact on one of the main stakeholders to be affected. Sorry, apologies to Mr Ferguson. I didn't address that point in my answer. Um, I was dealing with the other part of his question. I'm certainly happy to give assurance that you know, we're bringing forward the bill. I can't see what's in the bill, uh, but clearly uh, the provisions in, that will be presented at stage one of the bill um, have all been consulted on. So you know, you know, the, the significant things have been consulted on. I think the significance of having a, a later land reform bill offers us the opportunity for those issues which we feel there needs to be consultation, more work done in some cases, uh, some evaluation of, of evidence that has been presented. That is the opportunity, I think, for taking things forward that, that we believe uh, would deserve proper parliamentary scrutiny and, and consultation. Uh, I don't have in mind a huge number of stage two amendments that we are already considering. We obviously reflect on some of the points the committee make and other stakeholders make in response to uh, the provisions that we bring forward at stage one, and we may have to make stage two amendments uh, clearly in a normal way. But I, I take the point 
that, that uh, Mr Ferguson makes and that's why I think it's important to have a, a, a land reform bill that allows us a, a second chance to put forward a, a considered view and I do stress this, a considered view from all sides of the recommendations of the Land Reform Review Group. I hope people engage in it constructively. They look for the opportunities for consensus, which I'm keen to build, and I am proposing to do a, a programme of stakeholder engagement on the Land Reform uh, Review Group's report to try and get feedback from all parties um, uh, uh, on, on the views. And I'm certainly welcoming the committee's uh, you know, examination of the recommendations and your views, but obviously need to engage wider, uh, wider groups outside of Parliament on their views, as you have been doing, to get a uh, direct view from them as to um, where they are very supportive of things, where they might be supportive of things in the report, and where they perhaps have concerns. So I uh, give an undertaking, Mr Ferguson, and to colleagues around, the, around this room that um, you know, stakeholder engagement clearly is going to be very important as we build towards having a, a land reform bill, and we understand what we can take forward in that. Well, I'm pleased to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're in the middle of question four and a half at the moment. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I suppose I take a different view and I would encourage the Minister to see the Community Empowerment Bill as a possible vehicle for land reform. And I also feel that that bill has been consulted on for almost two years now. There has been a lot of engagement from um, stakeholders around community ownership. Um, and I would hope that we... I think it would be a sensible option to look at that, especially when you think about a land reform bill, how broad this report is. Everything that's going to try and get into a land reform bill, if we could actually spread some of that and do something a bit quicker, because there are also concerns about timescales. But Sorry to take up time, but the, other, the thing I wanted to ask about was about public interest definition, and the Minister mentioned that in his um, first response. There was some discussion last week about how robust that is, or some people have concerns about the robustness of that. Does the Minister want to say a bit more about his confidence in being able to define what a public interest would be? Well, I, I, I certainly um, uh, share Claire Baker's view, the first point of her uh, point, that, that we, we have had a lot of consultation on community ownership issues. I think actually there's quite a a reasonable degree of consensus about uh, the uh, support, if you like, even from those in the uh, land ownership community at the moment, the private sector, who are supportive of streamlining the process. It would benefit potentially landowners as well to have a, um, you know, a quick, quicker determination, an easier determination of uh, a community ownership uh, right to buy application or registration so they have certainty. So I think there's interest in all sides of actually having a streamlined process. So I think I'm, I'm optimistic that we can deliver quite uh, significant measures in the bill um, as, it, as it will be presented uh, and then we've got a second opportunity to take forward other measures which perhaps need more work to prepare the case and to understand its impact um, and the Rwanda Forum Review point to a number of those where they think themselves further work needs to be done. Um, but on the, the issue, um, so the second point, if you can just... Public interest, yeah, sorry. Um, clearly there is an element of subjectivity in any definition and what we need to do is get a degree of consensus about this but I would put on record I do believe that there are circumstances where um, you know the public interest isn't necessarily being served uh, where perhaps people have uh, an inability perhaps because of a very localized monopoly um, to, to, to get land for uh, uh, local social housing um, or for, for facilitating an economic development project might be something to do with just getting land for grow your own uh, produce and, and having allotments. But there have been very good examples where landowners have collaborated to do these things too. So it's not true to say it doesn't happen in every case. But clearly there are circumstances where communities' aspirations are being thwarted and therefore we need to, um, to look at w whether it's in the public interest to be allowed that to continue. Um, so, you know, there, there, there's, a, I think, a strong steer from the Land Reform Review Group about what they feel to be public interest. We need to reflect on that and come forward with our our own response in terms of the land reform bill, and perhaps that's something we could, um, if not uh, you know, for everyone's purposes, satisfy them in terms of a, a definition, but we could perhaps get a consensus around what public interest would be in this situation. And I certainly welcome uh, you know, Claire Baker and other committee members' view on that, uh, and we'll listen to their views. Here we've got Graham and then Claudia. Uh, thank you. Very briefly, Minister, can I, I, I look at this, the situation with land that already belongs to communities in the form of common good? There's a very good section in the report uh, covering this subject, and, and it's interesting to note and estimate that the funds held across Scotland total £300 million. So this is a significant issue. Um, 
the recommendations are probably best summed up at the end when they talk about having a, a system in place that adequately safeguards and appropriately manages common good. And they talk about the need for a new statutory framework and a, a duty to have a common good register. I just wonder if you can say, shed some light on the government's reaction to these particular recommendations. It was, um, it was not without a sense of irony. I think uh, one... one uh, a cheeky tweet that was sent to me the day before I went to the Community Land Scotland conference. I was at the Hoyt Common Riding, and um, as were, were no doubt others. And uh, you know, the, the celebration of riding the, the community's um, boundaries, if you like, on, on that day. Um, it's, it's a very important issue. Uh, one of the problems, that I suppose, that there has been in terms of the lack of transparency of ownership of land. I mean, I've, I've encountered again. Sorry to fall back in personal experience, but as a community councillor again, there was a wind farm application in here which impacted on the old Eaton Common um, and uh, none of us were informed about it because nobody knew who the trustees were, nobody knew who, who was, and, and it had been so so long since there had been any contact with the, the trustees of the common land, um, you know, we, we'd missed the planning process completely. Uh, so there, there are clearly issues both procedurally to understand the, the, the engagement in the planning process where there's a, a com common good issue um, and there's a, a, a common land. Um, implication, but also, as you say quite rightly, the, the revenues and the, and the funds that are associated and how they are used to the common good, which is what they were intended for. So I certainly welcome the, the um, Land Forum Review Group's examination of this point, um, but in the, you know, it comes back to the point about the public interest, I suppose, in terms of the definition of that. Uh, the, uh, the merit of the recommendations concerning in terms of the particular issue is intended to, to address, of course, but it's important that um, uh, we see common good in the context of the overall pattern of, of land ownership and the, the model as it emerges. But it's certainly a, a, a very important emotive issue, I know, from personal experience uh, in places like Selkirk and Hoyt, that, that you know, people feel that they've lost control of the common good. The local authority is perhaps the custodian of, of the funds, and they don't feel that they have a, a full say in, in how it's managed. But we certainly have to get transparency about what the common good land is, you know, where it is, and, uh, and, and understand how we can then use it to the purpose that it was intended, which is to deliver the public interest and in the common good. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Minister, and, and uh, to both your, your colleagues as well. Um, I hope seamlessly we're going to move into um, the issue of the agencies to support communities and oversee governance. Um, and I would preface that by um, stressing um, my support for the direction of travel um, for, for um, the, the broader diversification of land in Scotland and the support for community empowerment. Um, the Land Reform Review Group stressed, and, and I quote, the integrated programme of land reform measures that were needed. And in your opening remarks, you, you, um, you also referred, if not to the quote, to that, to that spirit, I believe. Um, and the Land Reform Review Group also recommends that Scottish Government, and I quote, should establish a community land agency within government with a range of powers, particularly in facilitating negotiation between landowners and communities to promote, support and deliver a significant increase in uh, local community land ownership in Scotland. Um, and so uh, I, I just particularly wanted to ask you about, um, before asking about the, the other agency as well, about the, the scope of that in view of the fact that um, uh, Highland and Islands has had a social remit, um, Highland and Island Enterprise had a social remit, and as, as um, you know, Minister, that hasn't happened in um, South Scotland, which we both represent, um, and indeed in other parts of Scotland. And uh, whether there will be, uh, whether you can reassure me that there will be a, a focus across Scotland for the support, which some have said doesn't happen so much in the South, but I would quite strongly disagree with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I certainly have a, a great sympathy with the case that we need to make sure there's, um, if you like, an aftercare for, for communities that uh, obviously are fortunate enough to be in the Highlands Downs area. They perhaps, because of the specific remit that Highlands Downs Enterprise have, which, as, as uh, Claudia Beamish has identified, does include the social remit, um, they, are, they have the freedom, if you like, as an organisation uh, in terms of statute to support communities uh, in not only building up their business plan 
um, but also thereafter in terms of um, how they support them in implementing it and taking forward the economic development aspects of it, perhaps, but you know, making sure they're sound organisations that have good business planning and they can give them that kind of aftercare support. So I think there's a very you know, much better prospect in some ways because of that for organisations that, that are taking forward projects in the Highlands Islands enterprise to have that kind of aftercare. Um, I do feel a lot of sympathy for organisations that are elsewhere in Scotland and we do want to make sure that community land ownership is something that's taken forward outside the Highlands and Islands area. It's clearly got very significant cultural and social impact in the Highlands and Islands for historic reasons but also because of the sparsity of population community ownership can be a very important vehicle for furthering economic development in, the, in that region. But we also want you know, a wide range of uh, community ownership projects to happen elsewhere in Scotland, whether it's in the south of Scotland or Aberdeenshire or Angus or, or, or the cities indeed. Uh, and so therefore there's a limitation in terms of Scottish Enterprise's current remit and I recognise the, the challenge that um, uh, land reform of have put down is something that I know uh, Mr Ewing is aware of uh, as, as the Enterprise Minister. It ultimately would be for Mr Ewing and Mr Swinney to bring forward proposals if, if they agree with the recommendations to, to change the, the remit of um, uh, Scottish Enterprise in that way and that would require um, you know, a statutory uh, uh, measure to you know, primary legislation to change that as I understand it. Um, I, I, Claudia Beams, I think you were going to talk about the other... Yes, so yes, so if, I, if I may... But um, if that answered your question. Yes, thank you very much. I, I, I sort of put that in really from the perspective of, of broader Scotland beyond Highlands and Islands and, and, and wanted... I appreciate that um, response. Thank you. Yes. I'd like to get it clear from the Minister in reply to us whether, in fact, Scottish Enterprise could have adopted the social rebate but chose not to because it's my understanding from the past that that is so from previous committees. And I may be wrong, yeah. but I think that their choice of the way in which they work is the important part here. I may, I may be incorrect, and we can come back to convener on this point. My understanding, good to today, clarify. My, my understanding today has been that there would be a, a, a change yeah. in statutory uh, provisions to, to enable that to happen. But uh, I don't know whether Mr yeah. Stephen Pathrani has had the ability to clarify um, that. I, I would... I think what the Minister's just described there is correct. I think there would need to be a statutory change um, in how, in, in the remit given to uh, Scottish Enterprise. But I think I would also stress again, you know, the, the review group here have identified an outcome that they're interested. They've also identified a possible way of delivering that outcome. And I think, again, we should focus on the outcome and ask ourselves the question, if we support the outcome, what's the best way of delivering that outcome? Is, the, is their proposed solution the best way? Are there other ways that same outcome could be delivered? So I think that's an important... And I generally put that against every recommendation because I think it's important to look at the best practical practical way of making things happen. You go. Um, Minister, in terms of the um, agencies that were put forward um, by the Land Reform Review Group, as, as you'll know, of course, um, the group also considers as well as the community land agency, that there's um, a need, and I quote, for a single body with responsibility for understanding and monitoring the system governing ownership and management of Scotland's land and recommending changes in the public interest. And also that the group recommends that the Scottish Government should establish um, a Scottish Land and Property Commission. Um, and evidence to the committee, uh, as I understand from last week, although I wasn't able to attend last week, was largely supportive of these recommendations. Um, there were some concerns expressed about costs involved, and um, could, could I ask you, Minister, for your views on these recommendations, and um, would three separate bodies be required, and how would they be resourced? I, I think just because of the nature of the, the question that, um, that Claudia Beamish has set out, I think that shows the, the scale of the challenge here. We have, um, I, and I'm not going to, to um, uh, gain say what the... the Land Reform Review Group was said in this respect, we're very sympathetic that we do need to look at the what appropriate architecture and the point that Stephen uh, has just made about the uh, the outcomes that are being sought is a very appropriate one here. If if we take it for granted that we want to make you know sort of have a better understanding of exactly what community ownership there is out there, um, how we help uh, perhaps increase that in line with government uh, priorities and Parliament's uh, uh, seeming will to do so. Um, then we need to understand you know, what sort of architecture does there need to then be to support that process, to ensure there's proper monitoring of progress against targets, to 
uh, to facilitate where necessary and, and resolve disputes where necessary. Now, the, the Land Reform Review Group made some interesting recommendations about all of these aspects, whether it's from a community land agency to, to the Commission, uh, and, and indeed uh, the one we have taken forward already in terms of a working group we're beginning to build up in terms of uh, looking at how we achieve the one million acre target. So uh, I think it's early days for us to, 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 to rush to a conclusion about what we'll do in terms of a commission or whether we'll have a community land agency. But what I can give an undertaking to, to Claudia Beamish is we are interested in looking at these sort of ideas and as um, a colleague has identified, whether they are the right way to achieve the outcome that we we, we agree the land reform review group um, uh, we should try and achieve, uh, which is more community ownership, and we believe that's a good way of delivering the, the, the common good in the public interest. Uh, but we need to work out how we do that and what kind of architecture we need. But because it's such a complex area, we will need more time to determine what's the best way of achieving that, and we need to listen to the views of stakeholders as well on, on the practicalities. Thank you very briefly about the concerns that were expressed about <coughs> cost. Um, from I mean, that's, that's, that's a, a significant factor here. We un need to understand what, if any, financial ramifications there may be. Clearly, uh, we've been trying to uh, reduce the number of public agencies that we, we are funding, and therefore we have to understand if there's a rationale, it has to be a pretty good business case to, to be put that, as to why we create a new one. Um, but we, we, we don't have a, a full understanding yet of, of what the, the, the financial ramifications would be, what kind of resource, what kind of skills you would need, and, and, and from where. So I think, you know, it's one of these ones, unfortunately, you know, I think we will need some time to think through the, the recommendation. But what I will say is we're very sympathetic to the outcomes that the Land Reform Review Group are trying to achieve, which is to um, facilitate community ownership, monitor it, understand its impacts and the benefits it brings to the public interest. Thank you. Um, Alec Ferguson, has a brief point on this one? Yes, it is, um, Convener, and I think it's been partly answered, but I, I just want to really put on record a concern I have here. I'm, I am I'm on record as supporting community ownership. I would like to see more of it in the south of Scotland, um, but I, I dislike the element of compulsion that is within the recommendation. I'm just genetically opposed to that. Um, but the, 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 the point I wanted to make is, is that I believe community benefit, community ownership, and the decisions surrounding all of that are very much local things. There are different issues in different communities, as I'm, I'm sure the Minister would agree. But when I look at four, to four new rights and three new agencies to oversee and, and guide all of that, um, I, I see anything but local. I see a very central bureaucratic operation. I know, it's not, I know they don't want it to be, but I can't see anything that stops it being. And I just wonder how you can reassure me that that won't be the case. Well, I mean, whatever we decide, I mean, ultimately, I would, I would say that uh, in, in, in respecting the point that, that Alex Ferguson made, I know he is supportive of Mulla Galloway and other community ownership projects that put that on record. But, you know, we have, um, uh, you know, uh, opportunity to, to strengthen, if you like, the, the support and the drive, if you like, from the centre in terms of giving the support that communities need, the advice, the standardisation of procedures and, and the advice and so that it's a consistent quality and, and, uh, and depth that communities need and to facilitate, because in various areas we are aware that various different parts of funding, whether it's demand-led uh, measures, whether it's for funds or for applications for, 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 for things, that some communities are less capable of in terms of having the internal capacity to put forward bids. So we need to have some degree of professionalism in terms of supporting communities that need to come forward. So there's, a, there's an argument for having some central resource in that respect. But I do take the point about having local uh, understanding and, and having uh, flexibility at a local level. But the process as it stands, the land before back 2003, there's a very significant element of local consultation on community registration and right to buy. Um, the community is obviously having to have a robust business case, which takes account of, in this case, the public interest. So as a minister, I'm having to determine one of the factors is, is it in the public interest? Um, and I take the point that Claire Baker made earlier on about the definition, and that may evolve over time. But um, we, we, we do have various safeguards in place which ensure that the... Uh, we take a view as to whether the public interest is being served in a registration or, or a right to buy, and that takes account of local views. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I, as, as I know from correspondence with uh, Mr Ferguson, not every consultee is always happy with the outcome, but you know there is a consultation process there, and it's for a good reason, so we take account of local arguments and, and, and local concerns in making a decision, and, and so any procedures that go forward will have to have some degree of safeguard, so it's not done on a whim, as some people have suggested, it's done with 
good understanding of what the case has been made and that it's in the interest of the community group if they are taking over ownership to have a strong business case that has been subject to scrutiny so it will stack up and that they will have a, a viable future that, that uh, gives them a sustainable future as an organisation. I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to discuss this further. Thank you. We will indeed. Um, we will have very limited time to discuss our next five questions, in fact about six minutes each, so I'll be putting a guillotine on questions and answers in order that we get through this, because of course this is a first stab at the process which is developing very much, and I realise that some parts of what we ask soon uh, will, will require slightly longer, but others are going to have to remember to curtail their introductions and the answers, please. So, Land Development and Housing, Graham Day. Okay, with that in mind, convener, I, I won't rehearse every aspect of this subject, but the review group does make several recommendations in this area. And I, I wonder what, uh, accepting that the Minister um, doesn't have all of this in his remit, I wonder what discussions he might have had with the Housing Minister regarding the recommendations and how he proposes to take them forward. That would include the possible reintroduction of the Rural Home Ownership Grant Scheme and I wonder what specific action he might be able to take within his remit to address concerns in the areas of land banking and the cost of building plots, for example. Um, in terms of the discussions that take place, there has been a, you know, a close degree of engagement between officials uh, developing the Community Empowerment Bill and colleagues in housing and planning. Clearly, uh, Mr Mackay is leading on the, uh, the bill, the lead minister for the bill, and therefore has had a close interest in issues such as land banking and those kind of points that have been made to through the consultation. Uh, so I can't say what's in the bill, but I can assure Mr Day that um, there has been close engagement with colleagues in housing and planning and indeed my, my own portfolio interest in terms of the, the, the uh, community assets and, and land team. So, so we have um, uh, you know, had good joint working between officials. I haven't directly discussed myself with um, uh, Ms Burgess those provisions because Derek Mackay is, is the lead minister for the bill. Uh, but we can come back to the committee with uh, information on what engagement has taken place uh, and on the specific point about the uh, rural housing grants. Um, we can get a response to Mr Day on that point as well, if that would be helpful, convener. Thank you for that. Um, can I develop two points very briefly? The, um, the review talked about the need for the introduction of longer and more secure tenancies in the private rented sector. Now, the Minister, like many of us here in this table, represents a rural area and will be aware of the particular issues concerning estate tenancies, not necessarily tied tenancies, but estate tenancies, where the relationship is quite unique between the landowner and the landlord and the tenant. And very often, estate tenants find themselves having invested in the properties and at the end of the day have no more security than anybody else. I wonder if you might be able to comment on whether we should be able to do something about that. And also the issue, again, in rural areas with um, housing plots peppered all over the countryside with derelict properties on them. Is there not an opportunity to bring these plots back into use? Um, or the houses couldn't be developed because they're not in any fit state to be uh, rebuilt. Um, and that would, I would suggest, tackle the issue we have in rural areas, where almost inevitably when a, a development is suggested in a settlement or a village, there is local opposition to that housing development, yet we all need, know we need more rural housing. So I just wondered briefly if you could touch on those two points. Firstly, to acknowledge it's a hugely significant issue. I mean, if, if I can put it on record, I mean, land affects us all. I mean, every one of us here in land, land reform issues because we all require housing. And... Uh, even if ultimately our, our only aspiration in life is to own a house and, and have a wee garden somewhere, that may be the full extent of the land ownership aspirations that a, a, a member of the public may have. But certainly there are all alternatives, clearly rented properties, private rented properties are particularly important in rural areas where there's quite often less provision from social housing providers, um, possibly because the land ownership situation is such that the land is all privately owned and it's difficult to secure social housing opportunities. But what, what we want to do, I can put on record is definitely use the land reform process to make sure that communities can fulfil their aspirations for, for housing where they need it. Um, clearly, I'm aware that the, the, the kind of, uh, I feel like the contradictory views there have been from, from, from stakeholders about the issue, about the length of tenancies. Uh, certainly, we need to try and improve the degree of um, certainty and, and ability people have to invest in a property. And that, that ultimately would be in the interest of the, the landowner as well, I would, I would have thought, um, to, to have people investing and maintaining well the, the, the property if that's part of the lease conditions. Um, so uh, while we haven't got a, 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 a definitive view, I can tell uh, Mr Day today, what I can say is some of these aspects are, are, are likely to be addressed in the forthcoming Community Empowerment Bill, but I can't say what 
in what way, unfortunately. Um, but it's certainly an area that uh, we're conscious of being a, a barrier to, to um, fulfilling communities' aspirations and indeed the aspirations of individuals in many cases. Look forward to seeing the bill. Angus MacDonald. Yeah, um, thanks, Convener. Uh, good morning, uh, Minister. Um, I, I was pleased to see in, in the review group's report uh, uh, the call for a vibrant self-build uh, sector for, for housing in rural areas, and it uh, actually brought to the attention of the, the, the committee uh, and stakeholder panel last week the, the Our Island Home uh, initiative, which has asked architects to design an affordable two-bedroom starter home uh, suitable for the Hebrides uh, and suitable for further extension later on. Uh, it's easy to build and cheap to heat uh, and to be in a walk-in condition for about £100,000. Uh, and I believe the self-build cost is sitting around uh, £70,000. Um, now, I believe there were 50 architects uh, entered the competition, which is a, a healthy amount, and it was narrowed down to six finalists, uh, with uh, Tom Morton of Arch Architects from Cooper uh, winning the, uh, the, the competition. Um, now, with... Um, so, so many architects keen to get involved in, in the rural housing uh, initiative. Um, what do you think um, still needs to be done to ensure that, uh, that um, communities can fulfil uh, their, their wishes to, to ensure that there are affordable and social housing uh, available in, in rural areas? Um, well, um, I, I certainly I mean, identified in the speech I gave on Saturday I, Two, two aspects of this. One, certainly, importance of, of of the point that Mr. Day has just been making in terms of housing sector and the fact we have opportunities in rural areas for self builds, for identifying plots. I would just point uh, pointed out to the Community Land Scotland conference in my speech that uh, for those community ownership projects that have been taken forward, I think a total. I'll just check with Mr. Pather and I. I think it's 140 plots, 141 plots that have been created in those. So. You know, the argument sometimes is put that you know, community ownership is taking away private ownership opportunities. Actually, in this case, they've created opportunities for self-build projects. Uh, I think over half or around about half of them have already been sort of started. So uh, you know, this is a, it's an opportunity in many cases for uh, stimulation of the local self-build sector. Obviously, that's going to be then feeding through into the work for architects, local construction contractors and, and, and generate local employment in terms of construction sector jobs. Uh, that might not happen in every case, and I'll put on record we need to make sure, obviously that's why it's important to have an assessment of a business case for community ownership to make sure it's robust, that it actually will uh, add value rather than, than, uh, than, than damage the, the uh, economic performance of the area. So in most cases, clearly they, they have been very uh, uh, robust business cases, and that's why they've been able to proceed. So we've got an opportunity through that vehicle. Clearly, uh, we're looking at uh, some of the recommendations the Land Reform Review Group have made around, around provision for, for housing and land for development for housing um, as being a way of, of stimulating that. So I think you know, we have already seen some success in terms of community ownership being a vehicle to stimulate self-build sector. And uh, I would hope that as community ownership expands up to the one million acre target, those opportunities come. And that's why we can be confident not only will it aid community ownership, but can also enhance private sector opportunities as well for pri private and smaller landowners to, to gain access to land. Okay, thank you. And, and to further streamline uh, the process, um, it's, it's good that you've undertaken to, to work with the Housing Minister, but can you also undertake to work with the Planning Minister to ensure that uh, the, the issue is streamlined? I, I certainly give that undertaking, and because of the close engagement on the Community Empowerment Bill, we've got a good opportunity to, to discuss these issues. The uh, next section is on the pattern of uh, rural land ownership, and Alec Ferguson is going to Thank you, convener, and, and um, obviously one of the sort of headline-grabbing parts of this report was that there should be a cap on the amount of land owned, and I don't think today is the right place to get into how much is too much and whether there should be a cap, other than I found Andy Whiteman's um, statement last week that nobody should own more than 1% of Scotland fascinating, because if Andy Whiteman would be happy with a potential situation where 100 people could own the whole of Scotland, I would be very surprised. But that is a potential outcome of his, uh, of his proposal. Um, but I, I guess there will be, there will be room to, to discuss all that, that, that side of the issue later on. But I wonder if the Minister agrees with the Land Reform Review Group statement that ownership is the key determinant of how land is used. Because I think a lot of people would argue and I'm certainly sympathetic to the fact that actually it's the type and quality of the land that is the key determinant to how it's used, rather than ownership. Well, clearly, I, I recognise that uh, 
uh, quality of land will inevitably have an impact on what land can be used for. That's that's a fair point. Uh, we also have, though, to recognise that, and I've put it on record, and I, and I hope it was done in a, in a way which um, was not uh, meant to be confrontational, but if I was being asked as a minister to design a system of land ownership, there is no way I would design a system that ended up with 0.008% of the population owning over half the private land. I just think that... Um, you know, and that's not meant to be an attack on any individual that owns a substantial amount of land. It's just that that's, that's, that's the fact of life. We, we have that pattern of ownership now. But I certainly wouldn't design a system that they ended up with that as outcome. And I hope um, the members in the chamber would, would agree that that's not necessarily uh, in the public interest to start from that point and end up with that position. But we have to be um, mindful of uh, the, the, um, you know, the fact that we are needing to be fair to all. That's why you know, we have the land fund and we've extended the land fund. Uh, I've indicated we've extended the land fund up to 2020 and indeed that we are prepared to look on a case-by-case -case basis where individual projects would stretch the land fund uh, you know, in terms of a, a normal year. A big project may come forward and might go through the, the threshold for the, for the maximum grant that's allowable under the land fund at the moment. And so we're looking flexibly at that and, and given undertaking that uh, you know, we're sympathetic to those opportunities that may come on the market for, for a, a larger state that a community wants to take on, that we will, we will engage with them and see what's possible. Uh, because we think it's, it's such an important objective that we work with communities to further community ownership. Um, so I know there's a debate at the moment about upper limits and uh, these kind of matters, and we're clearly going to study the recommendation report. We have limited powers at the moment in these areas as well. It's something to put on record. And it may be at the point that um, there are other <clears throat> As the point was made earlier on, if you're, if, you're, if you're looking at the outcome that you want to achieve, there are different ways to achieve it, um, and we need to evaluate what the options are. Clearly, Land Forum Review Group have put forward their, their recommendation as to how to achieve this um, and how to help move towards a pattern of fairer, as they put it, fairer sort of land ownership, and, uh, and I agree with that outcome over, over time. Um, but we, we have potential to maybe... Uh, use thresholds to, to sort of assess at some point whether it's in the public interest that someone owns land. I'll come back to question of public interest in a minute, if I may, but you have stated on more than one occasion that as the concentration of ownership decreases, there will be room for both more community owners and, you believe, more private owners. And I just wonder how you equate that with other strands of government policy like the um, land use strategy and climate change targets, because I think there is evidence to show that these targets are often easier reached where land management is in larger units rather than very small ones. And I just wonder how you equate all that together in, in formulating this policy. I, I would put on record there are, um, convener, there, are, there are states that are very supportive of our land use strategy and climate use strategy and have been very uh, helpful in terms of delivering land uh, uh, you know, based projects, ones that are on ecosystem level or or large-scale uh, landscape-scale projects where community ownerships have been involved, private sector ownership have been involved, NGOs have been involved, and clearly that's an Im important feature. Uh, but you can also achieve similar several, uh, similar level of, of engagement amongst a larger number of landowners. It may take more time, but you can still achieve the same result um, if, if there's a positive will. Uh, but I would also say that when it comes to uh, the point I just made, actually, in terms of the... Uh, where community ownership has taken, taken forward, how we can marry these two things up, how can we have growing community ownership but yet at the same time create new opportunities for private sector. The point I just made about housing plots being available, a community might take over a large estate and then release lots of smaller plots or indeed small farm units where they're not sent, felt to be core to the purpose of the community uh, project, they may release that for, for the general market. So you may create uh, private sector owners in that way as well. So. Uh, there are opportunities through community ownership to release more land for private ownership is what the basic point I'm making. And when it comes to coordination, yes, I accept there are circumstances where having a small number of large landowners can be a relatively efficient way of getting an agreement quite early in terms of how to proceed in terms of a, a landscape scale project. And I recognise there have been some good examples of that. But we shouldn't um, necessarily assume that it's going to be impossible to do it with a larger number of smaller landowners as well who will identify with the same public interest and the same uh, end goal as being in their interest too. Well, the minister recognised that the Victoria Nascent land project, which is a, li a living landscape, has seven owners and that they work together and that deer management groups are supposed to work together on neighbouring estates to manage particular aspects of our wildlife 
Indeed, and uh, as we know, in some cases that doesn't doesn't happen where you've got large land uh, large land holdings, uh, but equally it can it can work effectively where you've got small land holdings. So I, I think we we there's a danger in being. Uh, and I know government sometimes accused of being very simplistic about this, and I'm trying to take a sophisticated approach to it. I don't want to be in a position where I'm painting a picture where all uh, private landowners are a problem. Far from it. Many of them do a very good job, but we also have to recognise there's some that don't, and equally there's some community ownership models that don't necessarily work as effectively as they should, uh, but equally there's some excellent community ownership models. So I think we need to have a mature discussion which doesn't polarise the debate, that we reflect there are good models of private ownership working with local communities. There are excellent models of community ownership working with private owners, uh, releasing land for private ownership, and, and have a less binary view, if, uh, if you like, about the, about the debate, because I think there are opportunities for private ownership and out, coming out of community ownership, and there's opportunities to work with private landowners to deliver a wider public interest as well. If I may say so, I'm very pleased to hear you um, highlight the fact that there are good examples of private ownership, because that's something that's sadly lacking in the report. Um, Minister, the, the, the term public interest has been used a lot in this whole debate, and, and indeed I think some people would argue this is all about the public interest. Can I ask you how you see that the public interest will be defined? Will it be a local level, or will it be, as I fear, uh, by one of the agencies, or indeed a combination of the agencies that have been previously mentioned in this debate? Uh, I, I worry about the idea of a centralised definition of public interest for what I do see to be a local thing. <clears throat> well, I think the way that the Land Reform Act 2003 already works is, um, you know, there, there is a degree of discretion in terms of how you interpret the public interest at a local level. Clearly, I, I'd want to see, if I'm assessing the, the case for a registration, a strong demonstration of a public interest is possible in, in, in a project. And indeed, you know, the community owner or potential community owner is encouraged uh, through their engagement with our, our own officials and indeed with Highlands Islands Enterprise, others who are supporting them, uh, to, to define as well and clearly as possible what their objectives are, how they're going to fulfil them, how they engage uh, in delivering the public, uh, public good, public interest. And I think that that should give confidence that there are methods by which we can be sure um, and, and that there is not only community support through a democratic kind of test of community support at a local level through a, through a, uh, a vote in favour of, of registration or in support of registration, but also the actual business case being robust about these matters. So it's not... Uh, I don't think, you know, you can... You, while you can have guidelines and, and, if you like, an understanding, a common understanding of what, generally speaking, sorts of things that would be in the public interest, um, you will always have a degree of as I see it at the present in terms of the Land Reform Act 2003 to give ministerial oversight in terms of signing off decisions say, OK, that one is, this one isn't. You could have a situation where uh, potentially someone might apply to take over land which has been run perfectly well with good, um, good level of engagement, delivering high degree of economic impact for the community. And it wouldn't necessarily be in the interest to have it, uh, the ownership change for a poorly defined project which maybe didn't have uh, you know, a clearly defined public interest. And we have rejected applications. Uh, it's, it's wrong to assume that every... I mean, I, I sometimes regret having to do so because you feel sorry for the uh, community, but they haven't made their case and, or there's been a technical, technical breach uh, in terms of the Act, so we can't support them. So, you know, there are safeguards in place to ensure that the project is properly defined, that it is um, in the public interest and that they are compliant with the, with the legislation in terms of the requirements to demonstrate community support and so forth. So I, I am confident that, well, we need to streamline in some respects to make uh, some things less bureaucratic and less cumbersome, uh, th that uh, the principles that underline the Act are sound ones and, and that they, you know, they demonstrate that, that community ownership, when it happens, is in the public interest. This leads us naturally on to carrots and sticks. Uh, Jim Hume, land taxation, payments and markets. I, I don't have any questions on carrots, but I do have on, on taxation. <laughs> um, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, the, the review group uh, made some recommendations regarding taxation in their view to increase the number of uh, landowners in Scotland. So it would obviously be interesting in your views. The, the taxation was, of course, ending the exemption of agriculture, forestry and other land-based business, businesses from non-domestic rates, which I believe the, the government at this stage have, uh, uh, are, aren't intending to uh, progress, but we can clarify that to make that sure or not. Uh, land value taxation, uh, specific uh, species spotting 
uh, rates and the review and reform of exemptions and reliefs for agriculture and forestry land and national and local taxation. When I pushed the, the review group uh, and asked them if they'd considered an economical impact on what we would call normal, normal agriculture farming, uh, they said they had not considered that that was not, not within the remit, which I thought was a bit strange. So I'd be interested in your views and, of course, the government's views on, on these various measures, whether you're intending well, uh, to progress. Certainly, I recognise that there's, uh, in relation to taxation, business rates, exemptions, very strong public interest in this whole debate, uh, and from both sides, clearly. Uh, we did complete a review of business rates last year. The Finance uh, Secretary um, uh, and uh, colleagues, Derek McKay and others, have, have, have taken a review. They sought views on how business rates system uh, can better support sustainable economic growth. We, we see a, a very important pillar of government policy that we're committed to retaining the most competitive um, business tax environment in the UK uh, through our business rates policies, and we certainly have no plans to change that position. We want to retain a, a, a competitive uh, business rates uh, environment. Um, you know, we didn't feel, uh, in, in terms of the, the recommendation, given that we'd had uh, a very recent review of business rates and how they apply to uh, business, including agricultural businesses, that there was a, a case at this time to, uh, to, to change our position, um, and I appreciate that 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 has upset some, and that you know people were pushing for that to be uh, examined. Um, we um, we believe that you know we can better support sustainable economic growth, but still delivering the same level of income needed to provide local services on, on which businesses and communities rely. So, if the objective is to uh, support uh, the kind of services at a local level uh, that uh, business rates would, would fund, um, that we think there are better ways of funding that through you know government block, uh, grants to local authorities and other ways rather than having to raise business rates from agricultural businesses, many of which are quite highly geared. Uh, they have quite a lot of borrowing. Um, they are, obviously, there's a major reform of CAP about to be, uh, we're going through at the moment, and Cabinet Secretary will make his statement today on what the outcome is for Scotland. So it's a quite a, you know important transitional period for farming, and um, we give them a bit of stability in terms of we're not proposing to change the business rates environment. that allows those businesses to... Uh, take on board the, the, the impact of CAP for them without having another thing coming in from left field that might impact on their business at this time. So we just didn't think the case, you know, there was a case for reviewing that decision at this time. We think it's, um, uh, you know, important to, to maintain a bit of stability there. And in fact, we have got this competitive business rates uh, system. On land value tax, we certainly recognise there is wide support for a land value tax in, in economic circles. Um, we're still considering the recommendations made by LRRG, and we don't want to get into any kind of knee-jerk reaction uh, either way uh, to, to the recommendations in this respect. We think it's, you know, it's a subject because of its um, uh, strong support. It's worthy of further discussion uh, because we understand uh, the, the role it could potentially play, but we don't yet fully understand the, the potential impacts it might have. So I think uh, I want to keep, a kind of a, keep an open mind about that at the moment and, and listen to stakeholder views about the, the future for you know, how, how a land value tax might fit in. It's a very complex area and it would require a full economic study. The point that Mr Hume made uh, that it's not yet been done by the review group themselves probably reflects the, partly the remit and the fact they didn't have the resource to, um, to commission such a, a piece of work. But if we were to consider it, we would obviously need to have a, a full economic study to determine its impacts. But I, I do understand the group's reasoning behind the recommendation uh, and the rationale for it and uh, the strong support there is for it. So we are keeping an open mind, and we, we do obviously need to understand the implications of it before we took a view either way as to whether it's going to proceed. The, the only other one was just obviously the species-specific sporting rate, which is never easy to see. Well, there is, there is a, a, I mean, I, I know there's con contrasting views in this. There is, uh, at the moment, a position that, that taxation in terms of land, either land value tax or business rates is a, is a form of taxation on land, not necessarily the species on which the land um, is, is being used for. So we don't know that there's actually, I know there's an element of debate about this point, so I'm not saying I necessarily have a definitive uh, legal position myself, but I understand there may be um, no scope within the law to actually distinguish between different species in terms of having differential business rates on the basis of species. So that's something we obviously need to, to, to understand. The complexity that you mentioned about tax and these of issues, I take it that there could be a work stream that would uh, include uh, the various aspects of tax that affect land uh, that were taken forward together and that the land value tax um, inquiry 
would be seen as a part of that over some period of time. So this is one of the examples I think I alluded to earlier on talking to, to um, uh, Claudia Beamish, that there are examples of, of uh, work streams that involve other ministers primarily rather than, than ourselves, um, um, either Cabinet Secretary or myself. So we obviously clearly have to engage with colleagues. Uh, their officials are likely to be the ones that perhaps would, would have to do this sort of work or commission the work. So, but we'll obviously uh, feed back to the committee as soon as we have clarity about how we will go about looking at this sort of issue where clearly there needs to be a modelling and understanding of how it might impact and taking into account obviously the, whatever impact there is from, from the cap reform package. Um, and last but by no means least, the crofting subject. Dave Thompson. Convener, and um, I just wonder, Minister, the, the recommendations uh, from the LRRG are that we need a modern and robust statutory framework for crofting. It's not that long ago since we've um, been through some of this, but I know that the crofting law group uh, have collated a sump of, uh, interesting word, <laughs> significant uh, anomalies in crofting law. I just wonder if you can give us your view on whether, as some would suggest, we should tear up crofting law and start from scratch, or should we be having another look at it based on what the crofting law group are taking forward? Well, um, I certainly recognise it's a hugely significant uh, area of work. During the passage of the, the Amendment uh, Act, the Crofting Amendment Act, we, we had to address the decrofting problem, and I gave an undertaking to, uh, to members across the chamber that while well, they were bringing forward some other challenges in terms of law that we, we had to, for necessity, um, uh, cut short, if you like, the, the parliamentary procedure for that bill and keep its remit fairly limited to, to ensure it went through to address the problem in hand. Um, so you know, that being the case, we said we would look at these issues. Um, we are engaging with the, 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 the SUMP. Um, I agree it's uh, not the most charming term, but yeah, we are engaging with the SUMP. Uh, and I very much welcome that initiative that's been taken by you know, specialists in crofting law. I think it's very helpful. That will hopefully help identify for us the kind of 80-20 principle. What are the 20% of problems that are causing 80% of the difficulty, if you like? And, and that will help us understand whether we have to go, what, what the options are in terms of how we proceed to deal with that. Is it an, an amendment to existing legislation that can deal with these relatively limited number of very high impact issues? or is it a more fundamental exercise that needs to be undertaken? Um, I have in mind, of course, that uh, there are potentially quite significant resource implications, both for uh, this committee, potentially, and certainly Parliament, in scrutinising the, uh, the whole uh, crofting law uh, situation. And we have engaged a, a stakeholder group as well, a crofting stakeholder group, which involves all the key parties um, to, to look at the future, if you like, of the regulatory framework for crofting and its provision. Um, so it's a huge, huge issue. Uh, we'll obviously, as, as this year progresses, get more information from the SUMP and indeed from our engagement with stakeholders, which will give us an idea as to what the next steps are. Uh, but I uh, certainly am of the view that if we were to, to take a view that we're going to scrap crofting law as it stands and start again, that would be something that would be a huge undertaking and I wouldn't uh, enter into it lightly. Um, so I think we need to understand what, what needs to be done first. Uh, is it relative a limited number of issues that will make the maximum possible impact or, or do we have to and, and do we need legislative change or can administrative changes at the Commission address those in some cases? Uh, so understanding where it, the balance falls in terms of legislation versus administrative change and just how extensive the change needs to be uh, will then reflect on what, what the best approach is. You're, you're happy with that just now, thank you. Right, well, uh, you know, in summing up a uh, couple of points, I think, first of all, from Claire Baker and then myself. Thank you, convener. Um, it's been an interesting discussion this morning, Minister, and many of the areas you've talked about do cross over into other portfolios and other departments. When we think about the land reform bill that will be coming forward, um, you know, there's quite a lot of pressure on that bill to include... Uh, policies that roll into other people's responsibilities, and that's something that government's not usually very good at. Um, how do you plan to make sure the bill is as broad as possible and does take in the responsibilities of other ministers and is really a cabinet-focused bill? Um, well, I mean, the, the Community Empowerment Bill um, uh, that we are already undertaking has been a good example where we've worked with other uh, portfolios to look at their, the ramifications for them and engage in them. So uh, I'm not necessarily going to agree on the record with Claire Baker that uh, uh, we've not been paragons of virtue in this respect. I will, uh, I'm sure she, 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 uh, Claire Baker has made her point. Um, but we, uh, you know, clearly we recognise that when you've got a multidisciplinary team, you need to have good, strong engagement, both with 
ministers and officials in different departments, but also their stakeholders, because their stakeholders might not be stakeholders that I uh, or my colleagues in my department necessarily engage with on as wider basis. So we need to explore and exploit the stronger stakeholder lines that perhaps exist for other ministers as well and understanding the, the ramifications of a bill. So that's, that's why it's important we do take stock of what Land Reform Review Group has said. We go into it with a support for the sense of direction that the report has laid out uh, and the outcomes they're wishing to achieve, but looking at how best we can deliver those. And it may well be in some cases we can say, yes, we agree with that and we will take forward that recommendation. There may be others where we say, um, we have to modify or have a different approach, and I think that will be informed by it. But um, certainly, I give Claire Baker an undertaking. We will try and make sure we demonstrate a good example of, of uh, joined up thinking and joined up working, and, and I would certainly welcome uh, input from, from people around, around the table here and indeed wider Parliament on where we go. Well, it would seem that really we've got to try and come up with some suggestions for work streams that uh, we think, from the evidence we've taken, uh, will give, and uh, will give that consideration in the in the near future. Um, and I believe that uh, you know much of what's been asked, and I'd like to thank uh, both uh, the committee members and the minister and his officials for you know elucidating some of these points. Um, I'd just like to reiterate what it says at the end of the Land Reform Review Group's report. We offer the Scottish Government a range of recommendations which are summarised and we encourage it to be radical in its thinking and bold in its action. The prize to the nation will be significant. That sets these particular bar high and we hope that uh, our negotiations with you and your recommendations will indeed meet uh, that uh, set of targets because we believe it's in the best interest of the nation, the public interest of the common good of the nation to do so. And I hope that this will be the first of several bites of the cherry for us to interrogate you about the development of your plans to achieve these things just now. So thank you, Minister, and thank your you. officials for your involvement. We will take a short break just now in order to change over and uh, bring in new witnesses. Thank you.
Agenda item three is on marine and fishery issues, uh, and uh, our agenda item is to welcome uh, George Eustace, MP, the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Farming, Food and Marine Environment, to give evidence to the Committee on Marine and Fisheries Issues. I welcome uh, the Parliamentary Under Secretary and his official John Robbs, the uh, Director of Marine Fisheries for DEFRA and the UK Government. And I invite Mr Eustace to make an introductory statement. Good morning. Good morning. Well, um, thank you very much for the invitation um, to come here. It's great to have this opportunity to talk about uh, the common uh, fisheries policy and the reforms that we are currently in the process of implementing. And I think I'll just say a, a very a brief few words. I think that the uh, final agreement that we got on the common fisheries policy uh, has the potential to be a really radical uh, reform of the CFP. We know that um, for decades it's not really worked properly. There's been the scandal of good fish being discarded back into the sea. And I think the combination of having a discard ban combined with flexibilities between the way quotas work, uh, combined with um, a much stronger emphasis on regional decision-making, together could be uh, quite a radical reform. And while we're never, ever going to have a man-made fisheries policy um, that's perfect because the marine environment's incredibly complex. I do think um, that the agreement we've got uh, is a major step forward, and that's why we're keen to make sure we uh, roll up our sleeves and get on uh, with making sure we implement it effectively. So we've got um, groups at the moment that are uh, working on a discard ban uh, plan for the, both the North Sea and uh, the North West uh, waters. And um, John Robbs, on my right here, is, is on the, the working group with that. And um, we are anticipating they will submit their plans um, um, during the course of this summer, and perhaps by the end of this month, um, to the European Commission so that we're in a position uh, to, to implement the, the discard ban on the pelagics from the beginning of next year, uh, January 2015. And, uh, and obviously then we will begin work on the slightly more complex process of of working out how we're going to implement a discard ban on the, the wider white fish fleet starting in 2016. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, various members have uh, issues they wish to raise. Um, I might just start off with the regionalisation process and ask you if you can tell me how uh, it's developing so that the North Sea regionalisation uh, can become effective. Well, I think one of the key things about um, the, the, the new system is that rather than um, the Commission initiating proposals and then uh, member states having to go there and argue through trilaterals at an uh, exhausting long um, December Council, we, we've slightly changed things so that there's a legally binding commitment to um, fish sustainably. And um, it'll be the initiative will start to come uh, from those member states that have got a shared interest in the water to draw up initially the discard plans and then eventually um, multi-annual plans for the management of those fisheries. They'll, we'll still have the, the RACs, the regional advisory uh, committees that are in place now, and obviously the advice that they give will be uh, very influential on those multilateral uh, negotiations that go on between member states. And then at the end of that process, clearly, um, there will need to be some kind of delegated act from the European Commission to give authority uh, to it. I think we are making good progress in terms of the um, discard um, plans uh, for both the uh, North Sea and the North West waters. But I might just ask John, since he's um, actually at the table and, um, and very closely involved in those, to give you an update on the specific details on those two. Okay, thank you, convener. Um, the, I mean, throughout the EU, there are a number of regional groupings. There's one in the Baltic, which has some history behind it. In the North Sea, we've had a history of cooperation. Um, and then there have been further groups created as a result of the CFP reform. The one that the UK is interested in is the North West Waters Group that effectively stretches from north of Scotland down to Brittany. And then there's another new group in South West Waters and other things being done in the Mediterranean. Um, we're all finding our way forward here, I'm not quite making up the rules as we go along, but certainly working out how to make the rules work. Um, and the top priority that we've immediately had is preparing the discard plan for the pelagic, pelagic fisheries where the discard ban comes into effect on the 1st of January next year. Um, and all of the groupings are concentrating on that because within the reformed regulation, there are clear things to be set down in a discard plan 
and agreed regionally um, where you don't have a multi-annual plan in place as is the case now. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, probably in the Baltic they're um, being very successful, a limited number of countries and a long tradition of working together. In the North Sea we're being pretty successful. It's obviously more stretching in the newer um, groups where there's no history of working together, but there is a strong desire on the part of all the countries concerned to make it work. Um, and we're now at the sort of quite critical stage where we're balancing the desire to make it work with everybody's desire to get the best possible deal for themselves. Um, so we'll see where we get to in the next few weeks. I would only add that while I speak for the UK in the director level group, um, a Scottish colleague has been with me invariably at these meetings and we obviously agree our approach before we go and we're very happy to have a Scottish colleague with us given the very strong interest. Supplementary on uh, the regionalisation issue. There are supplementaries and other things coming up on regionalisation. On, on the discard ban which you mentioned. Okay. On the discard ban. Yep. Um, yes, thank you, uh, Minister. Um, I, I know that... Um, the North Sea Basin and Western Waters are both submitting discard management plans to the EU at the moment, and the deadline is the end of June. Uh, there is concern that, um, that the controls and rules should be the same for all states who fish, in, especially in Scottish waters, because otherwise you could get a situation uh, where Scotland is not on, Scottish fishermen are not on a level playing field with, say, for the likes of fishermen from Norway. So could you ensure that um, the, the rules and controls are, are put in place are, are, are the same for everybody, uh, for all fishing states uh, within our waters uh, uh, regarding the discard ban. Well, the key thing that I'd stress, and the EU regulation when it was uh, put together is very clear on this, is that the uh, enforcement um, uh, measures adopted should be equivalent. Now, the reason they use the word equivalent rather than identical is that we do want to move this forward and make it happen. And, and um, if you um, insist on uh, total uniformity, two things happen. You either have to centralise those decisions again back at Brussels, um, which is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to decentralise the decision-making. Uh, or, um, you know, the alternative is that one single member state... That, you know, maybe uh, isn't keen on the, on the policy as a whole and, you know, doesn't really want a discard ban, uh, might make such an unreasonable request that it sort of collapses the, um, the, the whole system. So um, while we won't say at this stage, because we want to move this forward, we won't say it'll be identical, we are clear that it'll be equivalent. Uh, and, you know, you're right to put your finger on this. It's a concern that fishermen raise with me, a concern, particularly with, with Scottish fishermen, that they may uh, abide by the rules and they're concerned that other countries might not. Um, so I, I understand that it is one of the, the most contentious issues that we've got in these, in these groups, because the focus of these groups is on the, uh, the discard ban, and, and below that, the real focus and the real discussion is around some of the exemptions on things like survivability, uh, methods of enforcement, uh, and de minimis um, 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 derogations and the like. So um, it, it is a... I can't, I can't say that they'll be identical, um, because that's not how the regulation is drafted, but we do intend them to be equivalent. Thank you. Jim Hume? Thanks, for, thanks very much, and good morning to you both. Uh, thanks for coming along. Um, mentioned about Scottish representation during uh, negotiations, etc., uh, and we're often led to believe that you know, we don't get good representation, but I believe during the macro regulations it was actually a, a Marine Scotland uh, person, Alan Robb, who, who actually led the regulations for, for Scotland. Is this something that's quite, uh, qu quite common? Well, look, um, the one thing I would say is um, we, we've recognised throughout the importance of, a, of the mackerel uh, settlement to the, to the Scottish fleet, not least because it's uh, um, you know, well over two-thirds of the, of the mackerel that we land are in Scotland, a vitally important uh, uh, industry for you here. Um, the negotiations on mackerel were led by the, um, by the European Commission because this is something that they um, have, uh, have competence on, on our behalf. Um, but it's fair to say that, that because the UK is the country with the, 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 the greatest interest in this and we've got a lot of credibility on fisheries in, uh, issues, um, you know, we are consulted very closely uh, by the Commission uh, on their plans and what they intend to do. And we, in turn, as UK government, obviously work incredibly closely uh, with the, the Scottish industry on this. Um, John, is there anything you wanted to add on the specific point about... No, I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, it is the Commission who leads on the negotiations with third countries. 
um, and you know, we all have to live with that, um, that, that way of working. Um, then on the, in, the coordination within the EU, the member states obviously um, discuss with the Commission what the EU line should be, and on that, um, I cannot think of an occasion where a Scottish official was not present, as you would expect, given the significance of that particular negotiation. Um, and the UK team worked very closely together in influencing the EU position, which the Commission then negotiate with Norway or any other third country. Thompson. Yes, convener, and uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Eustace. Um, I just wonder if we can elaborate that point a little bit. Um, officials are one thing, uh, but uh, has there ever been a case where a Scottish minister or cabinet secretary has actually led the negotiations on behalf of the UK? No, I think we're very clear um, that the UK, and, and I'm very clear that I'm the, the UK minister, not an English minister, and I happen to come from Cornwall, so um, I don't usually describe myself as English anyway, but I'm, I'm representing the UK when I'm um, out doing these negotiations, and I think it's really important that, um, that I'm fed at, you know, every part of the UK when I do that. What I can say, though, is, look, we, um, Richard Lockhead attends you know, virtually all of the council uh, meetings that we have uh, when fisheries are there. Uh, we have a very detailed um, discussion before we go into the uh, European Council to discuss exactly um, the approach that we're going to take. Um, you know, we frequently um, you know, amend our, our negotiating position in, in response uh, to some of the concerns that Scotland raises. So we work incredibly closely, but I think um, uh, you know, a, the, a UK minister uh, should lead a UK negotiation, um, but we should do so having consulted in great detail with, um, you know, with the devolved administrations, and that's exactly what we do. Mm -hmm. I believe that there have been occasions when there was no uh, UK politician uh, available or they had to leave or whatever. Um, and at the same time, there was a Scottish uh, minister who was there, but the opportunity to allow the Scottish minister to take the place of the UK minister who wasn't able to attend, uh, it wasn't taken up and an official took, uh, took the seat. Why do you feel that that's a satisfactory way to deal with things? I think um, because, as I said, um, we, uh, I go there and the officials that are with me go there to represent um, the whole of the UK um, and to do so fairly. And I, uh, I just think that's quite an important principle that I'm there as a UK minister, not as an English minister. Um, what I can say is that's not happened uh, since I've been uh, the minister. I, I always uh, make great effort to, to make sure that I can get there. We're always very keen to ensure that we've got uh, proper ministerial representation on behalf of the UK uh, at these European Council meetings. I certainly hope you'll change things. That's the implication of what you've just said. But uh, the fact remains that um, a Scottish minister, a Scottish politician, bearing in mind the huge amount of fish that we contribute towards the UK pool, uh, could equally represent the whole of the UK. It doesn't need to be a Westminster minister to represent the whole of the UK, surely. And the opportunity in the past hasn't been taken uh, when, when the situation has arose where the UK minister wasn't able to be there, a Scottish minister was, but the Scottish minister was not allowed to lead for the whole of the UK. Why is that? Um, well, I think I've made the point that I think it should be, you know, a UK minister who's in the chair representing all the parts of the UK. Um, and otherwise you would get into an argument of why is it a Scottish minister rather than a Northern Ireland minister or a, a Welsh minister, for instance. And I, I mean, I do find it's a curious argument. I know it has been raised before, but, um, uh, you know, to have a, at the moment... A, a Scottish minister who wants to leave the UK but seems so eager to, to sit in the chair representing the UK is something I've always found rather curious. But, look, all I would say is I go there to represent, um, you know, the whole of the UK when I do so. And I think it's, it's important that we do that so that we don't start getting uh, lots of, you know, confusion at a European level about uh, where, where we sit on these things. But, look, make no uh, doubt, I... Um, I regularly um, have discussions on these things with Richard Lockhead. Our officials are in constant dialogue about the positions that we take. Um, and, um, 
you know, there are times, for instance, on those really crucial negotiations when we do the December Council, uh, when we go in for the, uh, the most important part of the discussion, which is the trilogue that we have uh, with both the European Union Presidency and the Commission, uh, at that stage, um, you know, Richard Lockhead and the other devolved ministers do attend that trilogue with me, and yes, do lead on those issues that matter most to them. So in December, uh, Richard Lockhead was in that trilogue alongside me, uh, and he led on some of the issues, for instance, around um, flexibility uh, for anglerfish. But the basic principle that you've just outlined is that uh, <clears throat> it has to be a Westminster um, politician to lead for the whole of the UK because it wouldn't be appropriate for a Scottish minister to lead and le <laughs> because it, he might have the opportunity not to be fair to his colleagues in, in Wales and Northern Ireland and, and the rest of the UK. That's the implication of, of what you said a few minutes ago. Um, yes, I, I don't think I could be clear on this. I think it's a, um, it's a UK uh, delegation and you should have a UK minister there that represents um, the interests of every part of the UK. Uh, I don't think you'd want to get into a situation uh, where you had just one part of the, uh, of the UK uh, re representing that. So and I'm very much there representing every part of the UK uh, when I attend. Mm -hmm. But don't you accept a Scottish minister could represent the whole of the UK in a fair and a fair way? Well, I would just make this point that a, a Scottish minister is not in the UK government. Um, so when I'm there, I'm representing the UK government, which represents every part of the UK. Uh, yeah. And I do think that's it's different to having a Scottish minister who represents um, a Scottish, you know, the Scottish government and Scottish interests only. But look, the Scottish fishing industry is an incredibly um, uh, important industry here. We recognise that. It's, uh, it's almost half of the, uh, the UK fishing industry. And it's for that reason that I work very, very closely uh, with Richard Lockhead when we're putting together the positions that we take to council. Thank you. I think we'll move on to some of the new CFP and uh, Scotland's share of uh, the UK-EU fisheries funding. Nigel Don. Thank you, convener, and, and good morning, Minister. Now, can I just say thank you very much for coming, because some of your colleagues apparently don't come to committees in this place, and I'm very glad to see you and, and, and grateful to you. Um, the European Fisheries Fund is, of course, a pot of money that comes back from Europe. Um, it's divided across the UK, and as you say, you represent the whole of the UK. I understand that. I have in front of me the figures that Scotland gets some from, the future, from now on some 46%, which I believe is an increase, and of course is welcome, of that funding. But I also understand that we have at least two-thirds of the fish landed in the UK. So I wonder whether you could explain to me why even 46% is fair, please. Well, look, in arriving at these allocations, and you'll appreciate this is always um, difficult because also every, every part of the UK would say they should have more. Um, but we did develop with officials between all the devolved administrations um, a set of criteria which um, looked at the objectives of the new scheme. And for instance, there's a uh, slightly greater emphasis on the new scheme on things like aquaculture, and you've got a large aquaculture uh, industry here uh, in Scotland. Um, and it looked at some of the other uh, objectives of the scheme, like um, delivering the discard ban. And on that basis, um, they came up with a formula, um, and I'm sure John might be able to elaborate the precise um, criteria in that formula, but came up with a formula uh, that arrived at a uh, certain allocation. I mean, I would say this, that when, um, on the last EFF fund, the European Fisheries Fund, the predecessor to the EMFF, um, you know, when we allocated 40% to Scotland at that point, uh, Richard Lockhead said that was a big boost for Scotland, it was a great deal, he was very satisfied with that, that, that this was a great deal for Scotland. Um, so if 40% is a great deal for Scotland, 46% um, has got to be an even better deal for Scotland, uh, as, as, as far as I can see. And, um, you know, I think these are always, as I said, going to be difficult contentious decisions because of course, everybody would always like more money but I think it's a fair outcome and it is a, a significant uplift for Scotland. Thank you and as I say anything extra is undoubtedly going to be welcome but I'm still struggling with the notion that it's fair. You mentioned aquaculture well we have the vast majority of the British aquaculture we land the vast majority of fish and we do a very great deal of processing, which is also part of the industry, which is meant to support. So I'm still struggling to see how less than half, and let's not be childish about the number, is actually fair. Well, look, all I would say is in the, um, uh, you know, when we were trying to reach these uh, agreements, I think it was very um, 
fair to Scotland in the end. I mean, England uh, applying the criteria. England, if anything, probably should have had a slightly higher uh, uplift uh, than it did. Uh, but in order to, to help, um, you know, facilitate an agreement with Scotland, sorry, with Ireland and uh, Northern Ireland and uh, Wales, um, uh, you know, we, we, we went for a slightly smaller increase for England on the basis that they previously hadn't claimed it. There's a second thing here, though, that's important. You know, the big uh, argument made to me by uh, Richard Lockhead on this issue previously and, and fishing leaders has been that the um, uh, Scotland's tended to use its allocation, whereas other parts of the UK haven't always. So another important part of this deal is some flexibility, so that if into the, the year we find that other parts of the UK uh, are not using all of their allocation, there is an ability there, uh, some flexibility to move up to 10% of those other allocations, for instance, to Scotland, uh, so that we make use of that money rather than uh, send it back to Brussels. So I think that combination of a significant uplift for Scotland combined with that flexibility uh, to deal with the problem of uh, certain parts of the UK not claiming all of their... Um, allocation uh, is a uh, you know a really good deal for Scotland. And again, let me, let me be clear: the flexibility is always welcome. To be honest, if, if it's good administration, whichever way it happens to go. But if you're starting from less than your share to start off with, then obviously you want to get more out of it. The other the other numbers that I have is quite simply that we land some seven or eight percent of fish in Europe, but we get less than two percent of the EFF as well. Um, and I'm just wondering how that is fair. Well, um, what I would say on that is the way that the European Union allocates, so there's the, there's the inside the UK allocation which we are responsible for, um, in terms of how the EU allocates the funds to uh, member states, it tends to be on quite similar uh, lines to the way, for instance, they allocate convergence funding. So there is, there is the case uh, that those uh, less developed uh, countries uh, where uh, the industries are weaker would tend to attract more investment. That problem wouldn't go away, for instance, if Scotland was, um, was an independent country, you know, unless it became a substantially poorer uh, country, which I'm sure nobody um, would want. So um, it, the, 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 the fact that the UK has a lower allocation than some member states is, um, is a product of the fact that um, it's allocated uh, rather along the lines of the convergence funds. And uh, so the UK tends to get uh, a smaller allocation than some of the other uh, member states, but not all. I mean, Malta, for instance, per vessel gets a very small sum of money uh, compared to, to Scotland, and it's about you know three times higher uh, allocation per vessel um, than that we get here in Scotland than we do in in Malta, for instance. I might just ask John to come in on the formulas. I know you've made the point about, uh, in, in your view, that you start from a position that's unfair. Um, I'm not sure that's right because the starting point was actually on on a an agreed set of principles, an agreed set of criteria with officials in all the devolved uh, administrations. So, John, do you want to just elaborate a bit more on that point? Y yes, of course. Um, I think for both the allocation within the UK and to the UK within the EU, um, the, the level of landings is one criterion, but is in no sense the determinant. Um, the point of the Fisheries Fund is to help member states fund changes to the fleet um, to enable them to implement CFP reform. And there, in many ways, the number of fishermen is rather more important than the number of fish. And so if you look at the criteria, there are actually more vessels in England than there are in Scotland. There are more fishermen in England than there are in Scotland. There's a bigger processing sector in England and Scotland. Now, of course, in Scotland there's a bigger aquaculture sector and there's also more landings and more ports. So it's actually a mix of criteria um, and you can't just select one, but we can all select one and say, I'd like that to be the determinant, and that would give me most. But it's actually a mix of criteria. And those were all weighed in the balance to work out, as well as we could, what would be a fair distribution. Now, the result of that was that both Scotland and England would receive increased shares. Northern Ireland and Wales, because there's obviously only adds up to 100%, would receive reduced shares. The level of reduction was very, very difficult for Wales and Northern Ireland. And as the Minister said, um, as UK Minister, he so decided to soften that reduction. So that, that's within the, the, the UK. At EU level, equally, level of landings is not the, the simple criterion. Um, there's questions about the level of overcapacity that needs to be reduced in different member states' fleets. 
um, there's questions that there's the um, convergence issue in terms of overall levels of um, um, population and poverty. These are all factors that come into play. Um, although, in all honesty, we do not know precisely how the Commission determines the allocations. The only other point I'd add is that in the new fund, and we have yet to have announced, though we're expecting it any day now, the actual sums of money per member state, um, we expect that the UK will receive more on the data collection work and on the control and enforcement work, both of which are really important in the UK and certainly in Scotland, and we so expect our share to go up there and get rather more money, um, which would be very welcome. But it, it's not a completely transparent process within the Commission. We're waiting to find out what the numbers are. I might just one more. Uh, uh, thank you for that explanation, which is very useful. What that suggests to me is that an industry which is properly organised and operating efficiently and is efficiently managed, and I put that all together, um, is actually going to get less. And actually, those who organise themselves properly are effectively penalised. And, and public money goes to those who have failed to organise themselves properly. That is, a, um, I, I suppose, a feature of any convergence-style um, fund. You could say the same about structural funds, um, that it is, yeah. it is there to design to, to support those that, um, that need help in converging um, with, the, with the, you know, the best performers uh, in, in the EU. That's the actual stated purpose of, of these funds, and that's the purpose of regional policy um, the world over. Uh, good morning to you, Mr. Eustace, and to, and to Mr. Robbs. Um, in your opening remarks, um, you, you said, I, I hope I quote accurately, that the marine environment is incredibly complex, which I'm sure around this table we all agree with, and, and beyond um, this committee room today, of course. Um, could I ask you, in relation to the new European Marine and Fisheries Fund, um, the degree to which, or could you comment on the importance of member states now having to reward fishing businesses which meet environmental criteria? And um, uh, Mr. Robbs has already mentioned um, some input into from that for data protection, but um, sorry for, for data collection rather. Um, could, could you highlight something about how um, the use of, of this money will help um, the wider marine environment and the sustainability of our of our fish and fish stocks? Yes. Um, well, the, the first thing to say is, having done the allocation, it'll obviously be now for you know for the for the Scottish government to work yes. out how they uh, spend their share. But I can tell you a little bit about what we are, uh, what our thinking is on on this front in in England, um, and we would envisage uh, for us, um, given the challenges of the discard ban, uh, probably the the lion's share of the so-called core funding, which is the, the the main part of the funding that goes direct to fishermen. Uh, we would envisage going to support more selective fishing practices and uh, equipment that helps fishermen uh, fish more selectively, which will have a big, uh, imp uh, you know, big impact on making, the, A, the discard ban work, and, and B, if we can make that discard ban work, um, a huge improvement in terms of the environmental outcome of, of fishing. So that is certainly where we intend to uh, focus the, um, the lion's share of that core funding. Um, there are, as, as, uh, as John Robb alluded to, um, sort of three strands to the EMFF. Nothing's ever simple at, at a European level. And the other two, one is around um, supporting uh, data collection and one around enforcement, both of which I think I'm writing saying are funds predominantly for, uh, to, to support government um, work uh, in that area. And I don't know, John, whether you wanted to say a little bit about how we would intend in England at least to spend... <laughs> Um, some of those two funds and whether there's anything to add on, on the wider environmental point. Okay, yes, absolutely. Um, we're currently preparing the UK programme which has to get commission approval for implementing the European Marine and Fisheries Fund. It won't totally surprise the committee to know there are four different parts to the UK programme and I'm sure you can readily work out what those four different parts are, reflecting the desire of the four administrations to have their own priorities, which is totally within our devolved system. Um, the, the, with, I think in all parts, but particularly probably England and Scotland, um, data collection is, is a key area to improve our understanding of the state of stocks, especially in the seas, and that will become more and more important as we implement the discard ban 
and have to and move towards achieving maximum sustainable yield in all of the fisheries. So we will be looking to get maximum benefit from that funding. The control and enforcement equally, and it was alluded to by Mr. McGregor, um, presents um, this ban presents additional problems on control and enforcement, which requires a degree of investment. So we'll be looking there to um, use the additional money to help us again to make the new rules operate effectively, all of which is aimed at um, raising, improving the state of the fish stocks um, so that that benefits the marine environment generally and, of course, ultimately leads to increased quotas to benefit the industry. Thank you. Um, we've got several more people on this subject. Uh, Angus MacDonald first. Yes, thanks, um, convener. Um, oh, good morning, uh, Mr. Jesus, Mr. Robbs. Uh, I listened to Mr. Robbs' uh, argument there with regard to using other factors to determine uh, the EFF split, um, such as uh, the higher number of fishermen in England, uh, which you mentioned, or the higher proportion of processors. Um, the problem I have with that is that uh, the UK government negotiated a 1.4% of the EFF fund for, for Scotland, uh, whereas a number of uh, other countries with fishing sectors similar in size uh, to the Scottish sector nego uh, negotiated a much better deal. Uh, for example, Denmark negotiated 3.1% of the total allocation, Latvia 2.9% and Estonia 1.9%. Uh, meanwhile, we are languishing uh, at near the bottom was 1.4 per cent. Do you not recognise that that is an unfair deal? Well, as I said, you can trade um, uh, you know, figures uh, endlessly. I mean, I, I made the point of Malta, for instance, where their allocation equates to around 8,000 uh, euros per vessel uh, on, on EFF compared to 26,000 um, you know, euros per vessel in Scotland. So, and, and there are differences, and I think I've covered why some of those uh, less developed countries, given that there's an element of the formula calculation uh, is, is, is uh, similar to the convergence one. That's why you yeah. would end up with a, with a lower level. I have to say, I don't think Denmark is uh, in a situation where it's less fortunate than Scotland with regard to the quality of its uh, uh, industry. And it's sitting at 3.9%. Sorry, 3.1%. Well, I mean, it is, as, as, I, as, as I said, there's lots of criteria that they use in that allocation. Um, one of the um, things that also the UK government more broadly has wanted to achieve at a European level is a uh, freeze in the EU budget. Uh, it's had cross-party support um, in Westminster. The SNP uh, joined with, with Conservatives and others to vote for a freeze uh, in the EU budget. And um, when you do that, there are implications. And, and all of us, all the uh, parties that we have, wanted to freeze that EU budget. And it does mean that sometimes you're um, not going to... Um, uh, you know, it does mean that sometimes there are difficult choices to make on the budget. Graham Day. Uh, uh, thank you and good morning. Um, Scotland's new Conservative MEP and Duncan recently suggested that the European Fisheries Funds should be spelt, spent elsewhere rather than in Scotland. And his justification for that, and I quote, was the funds should go to those places which are struggling. The Scottish industry is not struggling. But as we heard from yourself earlier today, Scotland actually has been using up all of its allocation of, of the funding. Uh, would you not accept that that is an indication that the demand does lie here and that we are, in fact, struggling? There are always challenges in the uh, fishing industry, um, not just in Scotland, but elsewhere. It's a, uh, uh, you know, we've had an incredibly difficult winter, for instance, in the southwest, and fishermen down there uh, with the storms have had a very difficult time. But, um, I mean, I just come back to what I said in uh, the opening, really. We recognise that uh, Scotland has tended to use all its allocation. One of the reasons why we've done two things, we've increased it, first of all, from 40 to 46 uh, percent of the UK allocation. It's a major increase, but also added this flexibility so that if we have a situation in future uh, where other parts of the UK are underutilising their allocation, sure, we will transfer that to Scotland because we don't want these funds uh, to go unused. And so I think having that flexibility has been an important part of the agreements here, um, and it was a, I think it's a, it's a good solution and a good way forward. So you wouldn't agree with Mr Duncan, you recognise there is a demand for these funds and a need for them to come to Scotland? Look, we recognise that there's a role for these funds, absolutely, and that's why um, we will be putting quite a lot of effort into England in terms of designing where we use it. We, we can see it's got a very important role to play, for instance, uh, in, in, 
investment in, in more selective net gear uh, mm -hmm. to make the discard ban work. Um, I don't know, uh, the, the comments that you made might have been in this uh, broader context about the EU allocations rather than the allocations here within uh, the UK, because I think we've demonstrated that we recognise the importance of fishing uh, in Scotland. That's why we've allocated 46% uh, yeah, that, from 40. Okay, uh, thank you for that answer. Can I just develop just a little bit further to get off a slight tangent? Um, in the press release, it was released uh, yesterday by DEFRA, there's a reference to accessing these funds for the processing sector. I just wonder if you could outline what exactly the processing sector can get from these funds, because um, much of Scotland's processing sector at the moment is finding it very difficult uh, just now because of lack of continuity of supply, for example, and they're struggling to attract new entrants, which has got obvious problems going forward. So I just wonder what uh, criteria apply to the, fund, the, the funds for the processing sector that might allow them to, to, to uh, get some benefit from them. Well, I might ask um, John in a moment just to give the specific criteria, but the, the previous EFF fund and the new EMFF fund does um, uh, you know, allow for investment in, in processing. Uh, I know they visited uh, Peterhead towards the end of uh, last year, and I know they were hoping to be able to access some of those funds to, to upgrade some of the um, facilities they've got there. So, um, you know, it is the, the type of thing it has funded um, previously is, you know, investment in, in equipment and uh, capacity to do fish processing. And, um, you know, obviously one of the other implications potentially of the, of the discard ban is you may be uh, landing more unwanted bycatch and you may therefore need some additional capacity in some places to, uh, to increase your, your ability to process fish. It's too early to tell really to the extent to which that will happen. And certainly in many parts of the country, there's a lot of surplus capacity uh, on, on the fish processing side. But that might be one, uh, one area that could be considered. Uh, John, is there anything to add to that in terms of the, the specific types of projects that the new one might fund? Yes, I think that's right. There's a good deal of flexibility. It would be very much up to the Scottish Government to decide how far this is a priority within its part of the programme. Um, I think the only other area I, I can immediately think of, in addition to those the Minister's already covered, is the potential to de develop new products and new markets, particularly for species which are currently not, market not deemed to be marketable, but actually just because there isn't a market, and that's quite a promising area for some species. Okay. Jamie McGregor, followed by Dave Thompson. Thank you. Um, well, can I just start by saying that I, I very much welcome the the fact that Scotland's set for a bigger European fishing fund share within the UK, and, and thank the Minister for that. Um, now, on the subject of um, deputisation of uh, who sits in the chair at EU meetings, uh, much mentioned by Dave Thompson across the table there, um, am I not right in thinking that when Scotland wanted to manage its own levels of effort, uh, i.e. days at sea, that the UK negotiated this for Scotland, despite disagreeing with the Scottish position, and that uh, Scotland now has that opportunity. And also, that in the mackerel dispute uh, resolution talks, it was Scotland that took the helm, but was very ably supported by the weight of the UK. Now, on that point, um, can you think of an instance when the UK delegation worked against the needs of the Scottish fishing in Europe? And... Would you agree that in the EU, negotiations, uh, being a large member state, is a very good thing? Uh, yeah, well, let me take those maybe in, in reverse order. On, on your latter point, that's absolutely uh, the case. I think the UK uh, is one of the, the major um, members of the, of the, of the EU uh, with a large um, number of votes. And uh, in addition, we're taking, we're taking very seriously on fishing matters, just given that we've got such a huge uh, fishing industry and that we're a maritime country. So all of those, and, and we also have a lot of credibility because um, we, we do um, um, advocate sustainable fishing and, um, and we're serious about it. So all of those things mean that the UK has got uh, incredible clout when it comes to uh, fishing uh, discussions at the European Council. And yes, obviously Scotland, because it's you know, the best part of half of the UK industry, uh, depending on which measure you use, and I know people have used all sorts of different figures, but roughly half, uh, it is something, um, it, you know, it is a, a, has a major uh, bearing and major influence on what we do. And I think that going there as the UK to argue for Scottish interests, which we routinely do, 
Um, and, and by the way, Scottish interests on fishing are, um, are, are hardly ever, I think, at, at uh, variance to the interests of other parts of the, of the UK. We're able to go there and have a very, very strong voice. And I don't think that would be the case with an independent Scotland, which would have maybe similar voting rights to, say, in Estonia. I think it would be different. Um, on your other point about the UK, uh, I would just make this point. I mean, I'm, you know, I have to go uh, and account for the decisions I make in Parliament. And if I'm unfair... Uh, to fishermen in Wales, I'll have Welsh MPs on my back. And if I'm unfair to fishermen in Scotland, I'll have Scottish MPs on my back, uh, likewise for Northern Ireland uh, and for England. And that's actually how accountability should work. I'm accountable to, to all of those people, and, uh, and they, in turn, are accountable to their electorates and to the fishermen in their constituencies. And I think that's a really important principle if you want that accountability to work. And if you had uh, a minister from a devolved uh, administration in that chair, they haven't got the same incentive to be fair to everyone because they haven't got um, all those other MPs uh, from other parts of the UK potentially on their back if they feel they're being unfair. So I think it's just a really important principle uh, that we get that right. Uh, but absolutely, my view is that, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that we can get a better deal for Scotland with it part of the UK. Thank you. Am I allowed to continue? I have another question. But not on that subject. There will be another subject, you've got okay. another chance. We'll stick to this one at the moment. Uh, Dave Thompson and then Alex Ferguson. Thanks very much, convener, and uh, morning again, uh, gentlemen. Um, maybe just to follow up on, on, on the point that Jamie raised there, he's given me the opportunity to do that. Could I ask you, Mr Eustace, if there was ever a situation, or maybe there has been a situation, where you, you said it was that the Scottish position was hardly ever at variance with the the rest of the UK position, which implies that sometimes and occasionally it is at variance. Therefore, representing the whole of the UK, if you had to choose between voting for the position of um, the rest of the UK, England perhaps, against the Scottish position where there was a variance, could you ever see yourself voting for the Scottish position uh, ahead of the RUK position? Well, um, as I said, I, I would always, in those situations, uh, do something that is fair and to be fair to all parts of the UK. But I come back to my point. I can't, I can't remember a time, and that has been the case. If I think of the last December Council, uh, we all had an interest in getting the right EU-Norway deal. We all had an interest uh, in increasing uh, the North Sea tack uh, and, and not accepting the, the proposed 9% cut. Um, we, we had an interest, and we argued very powerfully uh, in that December Council for increased flexibility with anglerfish, which was important to, um, to some sectors of the Scottish fishing industry. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember a time when we've actually been on a, on, on a different um, uh, page on these issues. Um, look, we, we've got shared waters, we're one UK, and... Uh, we've got very much shared interest when it comes to the fishing industry. Maybe I could just pursue that very briefly, convener, um, on um, transferable quotas, for instance, individual transferable quotas uh, were mooted some time ago. Um, the, the, the Scottish um, Cabinet Secretary's position on quotas is, is fairly straightforward. He doesn't really want um, quotas that are allocated to, the, to, to Scotland being traded, whereby those with the deepest pockets can buy up the quotas and you end up with Scottish communities not having access to any quotas. Now, I just wonder, you know, that there's a possibility, is there not, that that is a different position to the position you might take in relation to these things? Um, well, I don't think there is. I, mean, I might ask you to come in on the, the detail of that. All I'd say is that one of the key benefits Scotland's got from being part of the UK is that we do have... Um, you know, quite a fluid, quite a flexible market to be able to uh, swap and lease quotas um, between producer organisations um, within the UK, and I think that's quite important. And obviously we've got the Fisheries Concordat um, to, to, to deal with the way different parts of the UK relate to one another on, on issues such as where vessels are registered. Um, but look, I come from Cornwall, and when I talk to Cornish fishermen, they'll sometimes complain to me that there's lots of Scottish boats uh, scalloping around Falmouth Bay and, and in the Channel, uh, and that's something that concerns them. But, but you know, I don't begrudge that. We are, we, one of the advantages is we've got this... Uh, flexibility that comes with being um, part of the UK. And I think if you didn't have that, uh, you'd have fewer options to, to trade um, and, uh, and lease quota in order to match your, um, your quota, uh, the quota that, that a 
producer organisation holds uh, with the fishing opportunities. So I think it's a major argument, actually, for, for doing, doing these things at a UK level. John, yeah. is there anything to add on the... On the this, this, this is the previous idea about the transferable quotas, wasn't it? The, just the, just the sort of the, the background history here, which is pr pre, prior to the Minister's time, but uh, Mr Thompson clearly remembers it, and I remember it, because last time I was before this committee with Richard Bennion, we had a lengthy exchange on the Commission's proposal for transferable fishing concessions, and I think that's the point you're raising here. And at that stage, early on in the CFP reform negotiations, we were clear in the UK we didn't like what the Commission proposed, but there were very different um, perspectives between Mr Lockhead on the one hand Mr Bennion on the other, and that we were working through. And we did work it through. Um, within the UK, in the course of the negotiation, we ended up with a united position, and you haven't heard about the TFC problem for quite some while. Um, and that's because we sorted it out in the context of the negotiations. So we may start with different perspectives, but we, have, we work it through until we've got a shared position. Thank you for that. I just wondered, Minister, would you be in favour of um, allowing the Scottish Government to ring fence quotas within Scotland's uh, seats? Would that be something that you would consider to ensure that the quotas remain you know, for, for the use of our local communities around Scotland? <coughs> um, look, at, at the moment, we've got, I, I think, the right balance with the, the fisheries concordat, but make sure you don't get uh, vessels trying to um, circumvent um, enforcement measures that a particular part of, uh, or a particular UK administration might have put in place. But the benefits of having a, uh, a larger pool that, that producer organisations are able to uh, lease freely between themselves so that they actually match fishing opportunities to, um, uh, you know, match the fishing opportunities of the fish that are available. So I, I don't think it would be in Scotland's interest to, to sort of withdraw from that and have a, a much smaller um, um, quota allocation uh, that it's unable to, uh, and, and, and deny it the flexibility um, to trade that with the rest of the UK. Okay, thank you. Mike Ferguson. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, very brief, Minister. Good morning to you. And could I just say, as somebody with a Cornish wife, I long ago learnt that um, introducing as English was not in my domestic interest. <laughs> um, so welcome to the committee. Mm -hmm. Can I just clarify one thing I think you said quite early on in this de debate? which was, I think you said, that the criteria for EFF funding allocation within the UK was entirely agreed by all the devolved assemblies and parliaments within the UK. Is that what you said? Um, the, the process that we went through um, was quite an exhaustive process at official level. Um, so there were long discussions between officials between all of the uh, devolved assemblies. Um, and, and, and the UK. And, uh, yes, my understanding is that we got to a position at the end where everybody said um, this is, uh, you know, they would broadly be content with this. Um, so that is, um, that's, where we, that's where we got to. I should also say that I did have a discussion on this point with uh, Richard Lockhead, uh, I think at the beginning of this year, at one of the fisheries councils that we had. And he was very clear with me then that he understood the, the difficulties in reaching the, these agreements where everybody obviously wants more than, um, th than they might be allocated. And that his preference was that we, if we could get somewhere that, that was you know, reasonably fair and dealt with this, uh, his, his, his pr primary point was the, the fact that Scotland um, had used its allocation and the, the other parts previously hadn't. If we could find a way of addressing that, um, then he would prefer to see a decision made so that we were, had, had clarity and certainty about the funds and, uh, and fishing businesses could prepare for it. He would prefer that than to see a long, protracted process that, that maybe went for many months or even, or even years. That's fantastic. Thank you. Minister, um, it's a fact that uh, you already mentioned that uh, Britain has a strong role to play in these negotiations, and yet... Denmark got 3.1% of the uh, funds, as has been previously said. Latvia, 29 Estonia, uh, that small independent country in the Baltics, 1.9%. Scotland's got about 1.1%, uh, the second lowest funding per tonne of fish in Europe. Do you think that's a very good outcome for the UK negotiation? Well, I would simply come back to what I said that you know we've, uh, and this is 
this has long been the case. It's, it's quite complicated the way that the European Union calculate these types of allocations. But there is a strong element on it of, uh, of looking at um, things like the convergence criteria. And, uh, and yes, that does mean with this particular fund um, that the UK perhaps gets less than, say, Denmark. But as I said, if you look at the um, amount it gets per vessel, considerably more than a country like Malta. So there's, there's lots of anomalies in the way any EU scheme of this sort works. Um, John, I might just ask on the, well, there's a bit more detail we can give about the precise nature and the, the formula that, that the EU follows when doing these types of allocations. Yes, of course. I mean, first of all, this is not um, a, a negotiation of the normal sort, this allocation by the European Commission. It's not like a council negotiation between the member states to reform the CFP, where the UK obviously works very closely with the other big member states to exert maximum influence. This is an issue which the Commission decides, so it's not a negotiation of the normal sort. I think the percentages you were reading out, um, I, I don't have them in front of me, but I guess those are the um, allocations under the current European Fisheries Fund rather than the future European Maritime and Fisheries Fund. And so, and those we have yet to learn what they are. We should learn in the next few days. But certainly in the past, Denmark had by far the largest fleet in the EU, and it has reduced a vast amount of that fleet and closed down big chunks of its industry. And that was the reason, essentially, why Denmark got the amount it did. Now, we did not make the case for having a very large amount of money to close down much of the Scottish industry. You know, we would not want to do that. Um, and you have to look in each case, each country, as to what the reasoning is try to discern what the reasoning is that the Commission applied in determining the shares. Sometimes it's convergence, sometimes it's needing to, um, in the case of the new member states, change their entire way of operating to introduce the CFP. Well, that was obviously an issue when Estonia got its share. is not hasn't been an issue for Scotland since 1973, or subsequently when we developed the CFP. So that there are different reasons. I see. Um, so that perhaps might uh, explain why Spain got 25% of the fund in the last uh, period of time, which you know doesn't seem to have reduced their fishing effort that much. I think you'll find that, I mean, again, subsequent to Denmark having the largest fleet, Spain, <laughs> Spain had a very large fleet, a lot of overcapacity, big issues with poor enforcement and control, um, and big issues with losing um, fishing opportunities in third countries, a lot of problems. Now, I'm not saying I do not know how far they've invested the money wisely, but there were reasons in the Commission's thinking behind why a lot of investment was needed in Spain to sort things out. I'd just like to finish this particular line of questioning with another point from uh, your press release yesterday that says that the Scottish fisheries sector was to receive the greatest share of the UK Fisheries Fund. That's correct, but I'm surprised, and although it's not in quotes at the end, it says Scotland receives a large amount of the current European Fisheries Fund compared with other well-developed member states. But you then use an analogy about vessels per country, like it receives 26,000 uh, K euro for... Uh, 26k euro for each vessel compared to 12k for Finland, 18 for Ireland and 15 for England. Isn't this the wrong analogy because you've said that uh, data enforcement, the number of fishermen and so on are really important and the processing sector which is part of our activities. So in fact using this analogy is actually spin. Well, look, there are different ways you can look at these things, but I would say, um, and, and we've made this clear in England, if, if uh, we are to use the EMFF um, uh, partly as a, as a way of investing in more selective net gear uh, and the like, <clears throat> then uh, I don't think it's uh, an irrelevance, the number of vessels that you're trying to uh, support in that endeavour. Um, and there, you know, there are different ways of, um, of, of looking at these figures, but... You know, as, as, as John said, this is something that is uh, very much decided at a uh, commission level, and they have lots of different factors uh, in the way they, they make an allocation to member states. The bit that we control uh, is the allocation within the UK. And I, I just come back to what I said at the beginning. I think we've been 
um, you know, very, very uh, fair. This is a great deal for, uh, for Scotland. Um, as I said, um, when we had 40%, that was heralded as a very good deal for Scotland at the time uh, by Richard Lockhead. We're now to 46%. And so I think that's the bit that you can um, judge the UK government on, and I think we've been uh, you know, very, very fair uh, to Scotland in this allocation. So do you think then that uh, since we had two, the second lowest funding per tonne in Europe and several other measures the last time round that it's going to make much difference at all? Well, um, coming back to what John said, you know, we are expecting any day now, um, possibly even later today, but certainly I think possibly by the end of the week, um, the EU to confirm the allocation that it's making uh, to, to EU member states. Perhaps that would be a time uh, to, 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 to rerun all of these formulas in terms of amounts per vessel, absolute amounts and amounts per tonne. Thank you. Um, we want to move on to fish quotas just now, uh, Mr Eustace and Claire Baker. Uh, some questions about that. Um, thank you, Convener. Uh, good afternoon. We've had a few questions already around um, quotas, but I'd like to ask you a bit about the Concordat, which has been now in place for the past year. It's actually been in operation. Um, and we have touched on the subject of the referendum, which obviously dominates a lot of Scottish discussion at the moment. Could, the, could you clarify what the status of the Concordat would be, what, what the status of it currently is, and what the status of it would be if Scotland was to um, leave the rest of the United Kingdom? Well, at the moment, and the Concordat was, was drawn up to, to solve a particular problem, which is if you've got um, a, uh, effectively a, uh, a total allowable catches set at a, um, uh, allocated at a, at a UK level, but um, quite a significant amount of, um, of devolved responsibility for enforcement. There had been some particular concerns with um, you know, some parts of the UK. England, I think, was the one that triggered the... Uh, the, the change had tried to, to make some licensing change to help support uh, their enforcement measures, and they then found that boats were trying to get around that by registering uh, at other ports in other parts of the UK to circumvent uh, the, um, uh, the, the enforcement measures that that one devolved part was putting in place. So it was an important, uh, important step, I think, to get some agreement, uh, and the, the principal one is that boats should be registered at the port uh, at which they land most of their fish and where most of their um, 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 their activity goes on, or that they should have uh, a, a, another connection with that particular part of the of the UK. So I think that's I think it's been a, an important step forward. Obviously, it's still uh, quite young. It was only brought in place during the summer of 2012, um, and there have been you know some issues and um, some tensions, obviously, uh, around how it works. But broadly, I think it's been successful. Um, Look, if, uh, if Scotland left the, the, the UK, I mean, well, clearly, if Scotland left the UK, the first thing that happened would be outside of the EU for certainly a period of time and would then be in accession negotiations to try to get back in. Uh, so the position of Scotland in that interim period before it had negotiated accession uh, would be a, a, as a country outside of the, uh, of the, never mind outside the UK, but outside of the EU as well. Um, which would be a very different sort of relationship. That would be you know, probably closer to the sort of thing, uh, sort of discussions we have with, with countries at the moment, such as Norway and Iceland. Um, but um, uh, we would have to, you know, if there were, clearly, look, if there, was a, if there was a vote for Scotland to, to leave the UK, there would be a long period of uh, negotiations where we try to work out um, these types of issues. But, but it would certainly be, it would be complicated. So I don't have the immediate answer to whether the Concordat, I suppose it would no, no longer be a need for the Concordat in such a situation, John, presumably? Um, no. Or it's uncharted territory? I think Jim would have plenty of other things to worry about. Um, <laughs> um, the, I mean, it, it, it is a... The moment we have a concordat, there would be, you would, you would anticipate there would be negotiations. The concordat would no longer apply, yeah. and there would have to be negotiations in terms of what our um, quota share was and how the, the, the um, regulatory system works. Because, the, I mean, the fishing fleet, in, in my experience, largely identifies itself as a UK business um, that has a lot of cross-border business, whether that's in the processing sector or the catching sector. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Concordat is simply an agreement between the four UK fisheries ministers on the details of how we manage fishing opportunities within the UK, <laughs> bearing in mind it's devolved so heavily we just need a few core principles and conventions about how we behave in relation to each other for, in the interests of everybody. Um, and as you say, the, the, the industry, who are not necessarily all great fans of this Concordat, um, do um, work across borders. I mean, a lot of the fish caught by the Scottish fleet 
are using quota leased from English companies. It's not actually Scottish quota. It's English quota, but leased um, within the UK to Scottish vessels. And that's the benefit of both parties, so that's absolutely fine. But it reflects the way in which these sort of internal UK flexibilities is present. If Scotland were to leave the UK, then obviously the Concordat would no longer apply to Scotland and we'd have a whole host of new arrangements to negotiate. Um, and one final question. You mentioned the, um, the system of leasing quotas that happens within the UK. You'll be aware that the Scottish Government at the moment have a moratorium on certain aspects of that and are planning to have a, um, a consultation into the operation of leasing. And I mean, the driver for that is concerns from uh, fleets and on, on you know, harbours about the cost of leasing. There's increasing upward pressure on the cost of leasing. Um, I mean, do you recognise what is leading to the consultation, but have you had any, do you have any thoughts on how the system currently works and, and the operation of the moratorium at the moment? Well, I mean, this would be a, a you know, a matter, the way it's, the, the quota is allocated to different producer organisations would be a, obviously a matter for the Scottish Government to, to look at. And I know, um, you know, um, the, the Scottish Government's made clear that they do want to look at that, uh, and that's why their intention is to have a consultation. I mean, We've looked at this in a, in a, um, in a smaller way um, in, in England in the, in the sense that um, there had been some quota that was being underused by the producer organisations. And so one of the things we're doing, a very modest change, is to try to take some of that unused, unutilised quota and move it to the, um, the under 10 metre pool for the, the smaller inshore vessels who felt that they were um, not getting a fair enough deal. I mean, all I can say is that even doing a very modest step like that was very, very contentious and, um, and, uh, and, and controversial in some parts of the industry. So I think it's quite difficult to unravel um, these, um, these, these systems that have been set up over a long period of time. Um, but, you know, there's no, I mean, there's no harm in having a consultation. I suppose that's what, um, that's what the Scottish Government wants to do. But there's a, I think there's a danger of these things that you end up with uncertainty uh, in, in the industry. And... Um, Producer organisations have got quite good at, um, at swapping quota and leasing quota in order to match the, the quota that they have with um, fishing opportunities that are available. Um, so I think, um, you know, my view would be that people should proceed cautiously with, uh, uh, with, with, with revolution in that area. Uh, but I can understand there's always going to be anomalies and, and issues like that that, um, that the Scottish Government's got a right to look at. Am I right in thinking that you wanted to have uh, totally transferable quotas that could be sold around the EU from the British government's perspective? Well, I think this comes back to the point that um, John Robbs was mentioning earlier. There had been some discussions at an EU level about um, transferable uh, fishing concessions, I think it was called at the time, uh, and that's uh, an agenda that didn't go any further. It was before I became fisheries minister, so although I've uh, got up to speed with everything that's current uh, in, in debate, I don't know, John, is there anything further you wanted to add about the TFC debate from two years ago? I think the key point is that you don't know about it, Minister, um, which, which, which reflects the fact that it's no longer current as an issue. <laughs> it's, it's an old, closed issue. <laughs> Thank you, Sir Humphrey. Well, you, can, you can tell me what I need to know. <laughs> um, uh, Jimmy McGregor has a question about West Coast. Uh, not about the West Coast. Uh, no? Um, uh, the, my question really is, um, recently... Um, our first minister made a speech, uh, the Scottish first minister made a speech in Bruges, uh, and on fishing he said um, that we propose a practical common sense approach to membership, which means that there is no detriment, none whatsoever, to any other member European, of the European Union as a result of Scotland's continuing membership. Now, given that there will be a negotiation of which the UK will be in charge of, regarding the sort of uncertain position of Scotland's future within the, the EU. Um, and as you clearly recognise, uh, fishing will be an important part of that. Is there a risk of a worse end point for the Scottish fishing industry than the present status quo? Well, I think that's always uh, the case, and it'll be the case on a lot of other fronts. You know, when a country... Um, tries to join the European Union and goes through the accession process. 
uh, and tries to seek the agreement of all the other member states that they should be allowed in, um, you suddenly find that all the other member states have got a lot of um, demands um, that, that come up. So that's an inevitable part of, uh, of, of an accession negotiation. Um, and and uh, my view, yes, that would be obviously the case if Scotland were to, to leave the UK, leave the EU, and then seek uh, uh, to, to negotiate re-entry. Can I have a small question on the West Coast? No, not at this moment. Let's try and deal with this matter first. Um, I thought you were going to ask about prawns, which you asked for early. OK, well, we'll see how we've got time, the ministers and ours. But Dave Thompson on that point. Yes, Minister. J just to, to follow up on the point you've just made, I mean, I would dispute the fact that we would be out of the, the EU uh, on, on September uh, when we get our yes vote, if the Scottish people decide that. We'll still be in the UK and the EU for 18 months. And uh, many, many eminent people have said that's more than enough time to get the, the bulk of the toughest uh, negotiations out of the way. But there's a problem for the EU. If your scenario is correct and Scotland was out with the EU, because the EU, when it negotiates with countries like Norway and Iceland and Faroe and so on, in swapping quota with these countries to allow 12 European nations who fish in Norway's, Iceland's waters and, and, and so on, the, a huge amount of the, the chips, the bargaining chips that Europe has are actually bargaining chips that come from Scotland's seas. Therefore, if Scotland is out of Europe, Europe does not have those bargaining chips to bargain with. And the agreements which currently allow these other 12 European countries to fish in Norwegian, Icelandic and Faroe's waters would need to be renegotiated without the benefit of the massive bargaining chips in Scotland's water. So it is in Europe's interests and the interests of those 12 countries in particular to make sure Scotland is in Europe at the end of the 18 months. Otherwise, their fishing industries are going to suffer very severely. Well, look, in any negotiation, both sides have, um, uh, you know, some chips. I mean, this is starting to sound a bit like a um, hustings for the referendum uh, <laughs> campaign uh, we, uh, for, reasons, for reasons I can entirely uh, understand. But, um, I, I mean, the only thing I would say, a lot of the uh, fish landed in Scotland process in Scotland is also exported through the European Union. I think Scotland should should want to remain um, part of the UK and part of the, of the European Union because I think it's the, it's the best uh, outcome for its, its fishing industry and its industry uh, generally. And um, that's my own you know, personal view. Far be it for a Cornishman to uh, tell uh, Scots what they, what they should decide in the referendum that's coming up. But that, I just think um, there's, a, there's a degree of uncertainty uh, for the industry uh, in leaving the UK, leaving the EU, and then going through uh, an accession process and a renegotiation to try to, um, to get back in uh, to the European Union with 28 other member states with their list of demands. And um, I think uh, you know, it, it, it shouldn't be something that um, the, the, the country should decide to do lightly. Sorry, let's move on. OK, yeah. excuse me. Um, Claudia Beamish on research, I think, and things like that. I turn our minds to um, scientific research, um, both from a, a UK perspective and um, perhaps your thoughts on what, what's going forward um, from an English, English perspective, taking into account the regionalisation. Um, how does this, um, in your view, inform sustainable fisheries and the marine environment? Uh, we've had the Aquaculture Bill recently, which came before this committee, which is now um, an act. and. Uh, there's also the complexities of, of other sectors in, in our waters and how that fits with the changing patterns which are being affected by climate change and, of course, um, biodiversity as well, just to set the scene. <laughs> Absolutely. And as I said in my opening remarks, um, the marine environment is an incredibly uh, complex environment, which means um, no man-made policy is ever going to be perfect. I think we've come quite a long way in terms of... Um, of, of the uh, methodology of assessing maximum sustainable yield, um, and it's a constant process of trying to refine that. But obviously, we've got the IC's advice, the, uh, the international advice, uh, which is you know, respected the world over for the, uh, the work that it does on, on, um, on, on MSY. Um, for our part, um, we've got in England uh, CFAS, uh, who do uh, a lot of work for us, survey work. We've got um, survey vessels that are out there 
uh, monitoring stocks and who feed that information uh, into ICs to help inform uh, their work uh, in this area. And we've also been really keen to encourage uh, partnerships, more partnerships between scientific communities and uh, the fishing community. There's been some great examples around the country where you've managed to break down those barriers and the suspicion, and you know, I've frequently come across fishermen who are suspicious of the science and claim that it's um, out, of, out of date. And I think the way we can uh, address that is by having more of these partnerships where, um, where, where the fishing industry and the scientific community work more closely uh, to agree a consensus on uh, the, the, the state uh, of stocks. Um, I mean, we hope that eventually, obviously, the, the stage after the discard um, plans, which are currently being put together, uh, there'll be a, a discard plan um, for the pelagics next year and then a discard plan for the, for the white fish, fish fleet the year after that. After that point, the regional um, groups will focus their attention on multi-annual management plans. And we'd like to move to a situation where um, you know, MSY becomes absolutely at the core uh, of those plans and informing those plans, and where increasingly we can get ever more uh, sophisticated understanding of things like you know, predation patterns between different fish species and uh, how uh, different stocks interact with one another. So that rather than having just an arbitrary tack for an individual species, you might start to be able to move to something um, that's, uh, that's more sophisticated and looks at, looks at groups of species and the interactions they have with one another. Now, as I said, that's an incredibly complex uh, step, but we, we should be constantly looking to evolve the policy um, so that it, uh, it, it, it's ever able to address some of these complexities in the system. So I think that the scientific advice is going to be really important. Uh, under the, um, the, uh, the new CFP agreement, there's a commitment uh, to be uh, fishing at, uh, at MSY for all species uh, by 20, is it 2019 or 2020? 2020. Um, and, and for those where it's possible, uh, literally from, from, from next year. So we are already uh, well on the way to, to having uh, MSY as the, um, the, the key objective of the policy. Can I just clarify, in terms of, I'm a, I'm, I'm a strong supporter of regionalisation and... and uh, and, and that way of going forward. But can I just clarify what sort of arrangements there are for um, sharing uh, between the different regions, the scientific um, research and the ways forward? Are there, are there sort of actual processes for that? Um, well, it's obviously the most um, essential level it's done through the fact that everybody feeds in all sorts of science to ICs um, who, um, who then lead on recommendations. But, John, is there anything else in terms of partnerships between... Uh, the other countries in the, in the North Sea and North Western Waters Group? I'm not aware of formal um, regional structures, but there are strong relationships between the, the scientists in the different countries, for example, around the North Sea or in Western Waters. They know each other pretty well, and there's a lot of cooperation. There's joint projects. Um, if you want EU funding... Um, for research projects, you need to have contrib contributors from more than one member state. It's one of the key requirements. So there are various means of doing it, but there's not a formal regional structure that I'm aware of. I have a question just now about um, the coastal communities funds. Um, I think this was something related to the Crown Estate's distribution of these, but also in terms of uh, the access for fishing effort into those funds. Did you have anything that you could say about that just now? Well, I think the main thing to say is that this isn't, um, doesn't come under the responsibility of, of, of DEFRA. But I am aware um, you know, that some concerns have been um, you know, raised uh, on that fund. And uh, I think I'm right in saying that the Treasury and a number of other um, uh, organisations are looking at, uh, uh, you know, at the issue of transparency on this and to try to address some of the concerns that have been raised. Um, I think from the Coastal Communities Fund, uh, from memory, Scotland got um, just short of uh, £8 million last year, which supported around 38 projects. Uh, so of the um, just over 100 or so projects UK-wide, um, around 38 of them were, were in Scotland. So um, it didn't look at the face of it uh, as though Scotland was, was getting um, less than its fair share of that fund. But look, I know concerns have been raised, and these are concerns that the government... Um, take seriously, so they are, you know, they are looking at this this issue. I just thought I would raise it just now, so that we have it on the record for future analysis. But thank you for that. Um, and uh, Jamie McGregor, uh, prawns. Oh, oh, very kind. Um, 
Uh, I'm an MSP for the Highlands and Islands region, uh, which um, covers most of the grounds for uh, prawn fishing and scallop fishing particularly, which are both important sectors um, to the Scottish economy. Uh, but in terms of these fleets, the boats are quite small, and a lot of them are very old. Uh, and I think in, in relation to the same thing would apply, I think, to some of your West Coast Cornish fleets as well. Um, in relation to the funds you were talking about earlier, and you talked about um, the need, the, the, the funds being on the basis of need, uh, there is a very definite need to get these fleets um, up to scratch uh, as, as to convergence. So do you see this uh, fisheries fund being able to do that? Uh, and I know you've increased it. Uh, and will it go to the areas where it's really needed? And are you responsible for ensuring that? Or is that a question for Mr Lockhead? Well, uh, in Scotland, it is a question for, for Mr Lockhead, because as, uh, as, as John Robbs pointed out earlier, how the um, Scottish Government chooses to allocate uh, that ENFF fund is very much a, a, a matter uh, for, the, for the Scottish Government. What I can say is, you know, under the old EFF fund, there was, um, uh, there was at, at that point an, um, uh, an opportunity for, for boats to buy new engines, uh, replacement engines for their boats, uh, provided that they were either less powerful or certainly no more powerful than the engine that was there previously, so provided it wasn't <coughs> increasing um, fishing effort. Um, I'm not, I don't think, and John might uh, um, clarify, I don't think it was available for buying um, new boats, but it was available for um, equipping those um, more, um, more effectively. And in particular, um, a lot of the EFF fund, and we hope the EMFF fund in England, uh, is going to be used to uh, invest in more selective uh, net gear. And when it comes to the uh, nephrop fisheries, uh, actually more selective net gear has been quite successful uh, in terms of making sure... Uh, they're not getting bycatch and, and not catching juvenile stock. Uh, is there anything more, John, to add to that note? It's a, it is a matter for, for Richard Lockett. Uh, I'm glad you know what nephrops means. But, yeah, so. Well, they're, they're called all sorts. Languistines, nephrops or prawns, depending on which part of the country you're from. <laughs> I'd just like to thank you very much for this uh, wide-ranging and robust discussion that we've had uh, about the current uh, CFP and the new one. Um, it's pretty useful for us to get the measure of what's uh, being thought by uh, the UK Ministry, but it's equally, I hope, useful for you to hear some of our concerns as the representatives of the rural areas of Scotland in this committee. And I would say that uh, we hope that we can repeat that exercise uh, should that be necessary. Um, in the terms of uh, our own committee, we will be looking at fishing quotas and uh, in parallel with the Cabinet Secretary's uh, consultation to try and get to the bottom of how they are traded and in whose interest they are traded. So I'd like to thank you uh, uh, very much, uh, George Eustace and John Robbs, um, and we will finish uh, the meeting just now in good time. Uh, but before I close, at the next meeting on the 18th of June, the committee will take evidence from a round table of stakeholders on the control of wild geese numbers, the petition PE 01490, and will also consider its work programme paper as discussed earlier. So thank you very much. I formally close the meeting and uh, we shall now adjourn. <laughs>